I originally, we were going to shoot in Fanoon, but... So, uh, let's just let that drink go. Good morning. The Tuesday, July 13, 2021, regular Board of County Commissioners meeting will now come to order. We'll begin with a moment of silent reflection for the first responders and the members of the armed forces, followed by an invocation by Pastor Randy Fullerton from the Glendale Baptist Church. And Commissioner Laura Moss will do the honors of the pledge. Please rise. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity that you have given us to simply be here today for the sun that came up today and the day that is before us. And Lord, we would just pray that as uh, we live this day that we would honor you in all that we do. We pray today, Father, for the commissioners here uh, that you would give them wisdom in the decisions that they must make. We pray for those who are here in this room that God, you would lift them up and draw them close to you. Father, we pray that everyone here today might embrace that which you had told your prophet Micah in Micah 6, 8, when Micah said, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. I pray, Father, that we would do that today. You have blessed us more than what we deserve. Help us today to do that what might honor you in all things, for we would ask it in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Please join me in pledging your allegiance to the greatest nation in the world, and thank you today to all of our veterans. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Thank you all. And thank you all for attending there. It's, uh, this is quite an abundant uh, attendance. So thank you. Next item, uh, we're going to do uh, additions and deletions uh, to the agenda. Uh, I'd like to uh, move uh, 14A1 on my matters uh, to pro proceed after 10B5, which is public speaking. And I'd also like to add the Indian River County Sheriff, Eric Flowers, uh, would like to uh, speak upon the same item. And uh, it will be sometime during the uh, public speaking. I'll make that motion for you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, I'd like to add an informational item as 7B. Um, there's a job fair coming up this Thursday I'd like to let the public know about. Oh, please, most certainly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So if your motion includes that, uh, Commissioner Ehrman, yes, I'd be glad to second your motion. Yes, that'd be fine. Upon motion by Commissioner Ehrman, seconded by Vice Chairman O'Brien. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Next item is a proclamation. It's a presentation for a proclamation designating the month of July 2021 as Parks and Recreation Month and designating July 16, 2021 as Parks and Recreation Professionals Day. And uh, Commissioner? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is, this is definitely an honor to, to do this. Uh, parks of any kind in our lives in this society today are so so very important, whether it's a, you know, a passive walking park, whether it's a full-fledged stadium or anything in between, and any of the, the centers or the grounds that we have uh, are just so so important to our, to our lifestyle and our well-being as citizens. And what's nice about this is that, that any River County has got some of the best, and we're getting better every day with our parks, and I'm glad to, and, and I'm so glad to see that. 
I, I know it's, uh, I, I've used this story many times. I've, I've, I've lived here all my life and, and I have seen the parks improve greatly in the last three to four years. And especially with, with Kevin, with, with your tenure now here and, and with uh, Assistant Administrator Zito behind this, we've seen a lot of improvements in the park lately. And, it, and I know you guys are so modest because I know it goes to all these folks here. They, they, they do the work. And uh, Mr. Chairman, by the way, we had the four and a half century softball here, 60 and over this weekend. And uh, we had some rain and all that stuff, but everything went off just seamlessly without a, without a problem at all. And, and Mike Knowles and his crew will be back next year, I believe. And uh, they were so, you know, and they were, they were very, very happy and, and they were very appreciative of how, what shape the ball fields were in. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, but uh, these guys do a great job, and everybody in this county should, uh, should, should thank each one of them for the job they do. And, it, and it's really a pleasure to read this. And let me read this. And, Kevin, I know you got some folks that you want to recognize uh, after this. But let me go ahead and read this proclamation, and, and we can move on and, and, and hear from the rest of the group. Proclamation designating the month of July 2021 as Parks and Recreation Month and designating July 16th. 2021 as Park and Recreation's Professionals Day. Whereas parks, conservation lands, and recreation groups are an integral part of communities throughout this country, especially here in Any River County. And whereas Parks and Recreation Month was established in 1985 and celebrates its 36th year in the state of Florida and nationwide. And whereas county parks and conservation areas preserve the ecological beauty of our community, improve water quality, protect groundwater, prevent flooding, improve air quality, are aesthetically pleasing, and provide open green space for people and valuable habitat for wildlife. And whereas, Indian River County is fortunate to have many beautiful parks, playgrounds, ball fields, golf courses, swimming facilities, nature trails, beaches, fairgrounds, campgrounds, intergenerational recreation facilities, the shooting range, and open spaces which make our community a more attractive and desirable place to live, work, and play, as well as contribute to our ongoing economic vitality through enhancing property values, increased tourism, the attraction of visitors, and recreational events. And whereas services that parks and recreation professionals provide are vital for our communities from protecting open space and natural, resource, natural resources to providing wellness and mental health benefits for all people. Parks and Recreation Month encourages everyone to reflect on the exponential value of parks and recreation professionals bring to communities. And whereas the U.S. House of Representatives has designated July as Park Recreation Month, and whereas the board values the essential service that parks and recreation professionals and volunteers perform to provide recreational activities that build healthy, active communities that aid in the prevention of chronic disease and also improve the mental and emotional health of all citizens. And now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Indian River County, Florida, that the board designates July as Parks and Recreation Month and July 16th as Parks and Recreation Professionals Day and encourages all citizens to celebrate by participating in diverse activities offered through the many facilities and places provided by Indian River County adopted this 13th day of July 2021 and signed by all five county commissioners. It's awesome. Thank, Thank you, Joseph. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner and Commissioners. Um, I got to tell you, I said it last year and I'll always say it, every day is Park and Recreation Day for us. Um, and we do it as a team and we we do it in strength and numbers and the knowledge that we all bring together. I gotta tell you that um, this year and this year and a half has been stressful for us, but I have seen this organization come together and provide everything from PPE to assisting with the uh, mortgage and rental assistance all, all the way down to making sure that we had facilities where people got their jab in the arm so that we could back, get back to a normal life. I want to take a moment and I want to introduce some people that may be new to you, uh, definitely new to you without a mask, um, and uh, <laughs> let you see their smiling face as we go around. 
And I'm just going to highlight, and I'm going to go very quickly. Uh, we got Jim Vento and James Barty, who, Commissioner, they were there saving the day this past weekend, mm -hmm. along with Brad Dusen, uh, our lead foreman with the Park Maintenance Division. That they keep the parks clean, green, and growing, and and serviceable and safe for all of our residents. Wendy Swindell, I mean, as our project manager with the, with Beth, where are you hiding, Beth? In the back, you need to be up close, Beth. So our conservation lands, I mean, this speaks to the heart of our county and what we do and ensuring that everything is healthy for now and for the future. Jillian P. Sparks, our event and marketing coordinator, that gets us out there and really, really in an effort so that everybody is engaged and here's what we do. Brad, again, thank you for everything you do. Scott Knauer, our fairgrounds and campgrounds manager, also filling in at DIG, I mean, was critical during these times and is just an asset that, God bless you, man, I'm always great to have you. Jerry Seldes, this is somebody that may be new to some of you. He is our uh, Indian River County range manager. I can tell you, if you haven't been to the range lately, it is, uh, it is booming, uh, pardon the pun. And it is a, uh, I can speak as a former range manager early in my career that Jerry is an excellent range manager for you in Indian River County. Somebody, Sandy, please don't hide in the back. Sandy Heveler. I really want to showcase, we bought an item to you earlier this year. Uh, we received a grant from the Florida Blue Foundation. She is our recreation leader that is, coordinates all of our senior well, wellness programs, doing a great job, and I want to make sure that we welcome Sandy aboard. David Smith, who is over our aquatics programming, he wanted to bring everybody with him here today, but all the lifeguards are on the pools because we're busy. Where's Scott Seeley? Scott is our recreation coordinator. If you haven't come and seen some of our rec, rec programs, uh, we have basketball going on now, and I can tell you that we have some players that are gonna, they have a strong future with them, as well as everybody that participates in all of our youth sports. We're actually bringing eSports to Indian River County, so stay tuned for that. We're rolling out something now. Somebody that keeps us all in line, that's Lily, uh, Lori Smith. And Lori is our staff assistant, and she, I consider her my boss. And she keeps <laughs> me straight, and we get everything done along, along with Jill Krebs, who's on vacation today. Um, Jonathan Billings, don't hide in the back. Our beach operations coordinator is out there keeping our beaches safe for all of our residents and visitors. And last but not least, Joe Tilton is the newest member to our team as a recreation program manager coming to, to us from Seminole County. Great ideas and has already hit the ground running. Um, and we're gonna really up it uh, as far as our recreation program. Did I forget anybody? No. So uh, then the next members of our team are all of you, uh, our county attorney and our county administrator, Jason Brown, and our assistant county administrator, Mike Zito. Um, I want to thank you from the bottom of our heart, and I, I'm going to bestow upon you Friday being uh, you being with us uh, in Park and Recreation Professionals Day because we can't do it without you, and every one of you is as much of a Park and, Rec Rec Park and Recreation Professional as we are. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, Kevin, two things. One, are any of your disc golf ringers in here today? <laughs> We have Brad, okay, all right. Jim Vento, I think James is playing a little, but we have some ringers in here. Yeah, okay. So I, when I get out there, I want to make sure they don't start betting with me and I get taken or anything. I want to make sure I'm doing it. We have some work. others that you may not know. Yeah, and that's what I'm worried about. Um, and then the other thing is, Sandy, I, I definitely need to get with you because I think some of that senior wellness is exactly what I need. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll be getting a hold of you here soon. Okay. But, you know, you all doing a great job. Um, Commissioner Herman mentioned in, in his early remarks, you know, the, you know, a community is known for certain things and what 
what you all do is what puts Indian River County on the map. When we have the facilities we have and the, the multitude of options that people can do, it, it's really a big attractant and it makes Indian River County special and you all the folks that are doing and making that happen. So thank you all very much for everything you do. Um, you know, we, we should have this appreciation day almost every day of the year. Uh, like you said, Kevin, every day should be a park and rec day. But um, thank you all for all you do. You're, you're really awesome. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Well, we, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, I, I believe we do have uh, a appreciation day every day because we have the finest parks and finest facilities in the state of Florida. And we truly appreciate what you do every day. During this very challenging year, when folks were kind of staying home and not doing any activities, you all were working on the facilities. You all were creating projects that went into virtual recreation. You went into so many different avenues. The biggest thing is you woke up in the morning and said, the park is mine. You took tremendous ownership. The people of Indian River County actually own those parks. And we engineer how it's going to be done. But you do the work. And you're there every day. And just riding around this county looking at our facilities, I don't think there's any other place in town or in the state that you would want to be at if you want to just get out there and enjoy the turf and enjoy the surf and get out there and no 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 surf and turf that's not that i might have blew a surprise i think kevin wants to do surf and turf for your celebration but uh in all seriousness uh looking at our facilities we've come a long way and thank you for every day treating it as if you own it and that's very important ownership so thank you um, Mr. Chair, I don't think I can say anything that hasn't already been said. It's an awesome department doing awesome work, and it's just my pleasure to be able to recognize them. So let's give them a round of applause and get them down here to take that picture. Two rows, okay? So you got to you got to stack up. Tall guys in the back. Guys, you. I got to make two rows here. Guys, you are the boss. He's right. Thanks for coming down today, and thank you for everything you guys do. Make two. Make two. Nice to meet you. Good to have you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Jonathan, <laughs> welcome. We have a little step See you, brother. Here, don't worry. They always put the tall people <laughs> in front of me. she is. <laughs> they make them big. <laughs> <laughs> Get your feet in the air. Right. Right. Congratulations. Mr. Thank Chairman, you, if I may. Mr. Zito, please. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Kevin. And while, while they exit the chambers, the agenda is long, and the um, good news is that I am, I am speechless, which uh, for those of you that know me is, is rare. Uh, but I just want to say, I really feel like today is a moment to stop and reflect on the work that we've done over the past several years under your direction and support. And I, I really see it coming together in the all-stars that Kevin's brought with him today. Um, most of them are less than five-year employees and part of the transition that we've made, again, under your direction and support and commitment. So I think it's time to just stop and reflect on that for a moment, but not rest on it, because we got work to do, right, folks? We'll get out there and we we'll continue to make it better and greater. So. Much obliged. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. They want to get back to work. <laughs> they missed their part. Next item is a presentation proclamation designating the week of July 18, 2021 through July 24, 2021 as Treasure Coast Waterway Cleanup Week. And Vice Chairman O'Brien will be doing the honors. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, April Price, she, there you are. Good morning. Good morning. Come on down. Thank you. I'll um, read the proclamation, then you can fill us in on some of the activities coming up, okay? Awesome. 
So this is a proclamation designating the week of July 18 through July 24, 2021 as Treasure Coast Waterway Cleanup Week. Whereas on Saturday, July 24th, 2021, the Marine Industries Association of the Treasure Coast, in conjunction with the Florida Inland Navigation District, will conduct the 14th annual Treasure Coast Waterway Cleanup. And whereas this event will attract approximately 1,000 volunteers who will participate in cleaning up the waterways of Indian River, Martin, and St. Lucie counties. And whereas 31 designated sites throughout the three counties will serve as registration and disposal sites for the volunteers to work out of. And whereas numerous waterfront homeowners associations have been recruited to clean up their own waterfronts. And whereas since the beginning, over 90 tons of trash have been collected from approximately 125 miles of waterways with an expectation of a significantly larger amount to be collected this year with an increased volunteer effort. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners, Indian River County, Florida, that the week of July 18 through July 24, 2021, be designated as Treasure Coast Waterway Cleanup Week in Indian River County, and all citizens are encouraged to use this occasion to foster appreciation for the Treasure Coast waterways and assist in the cleanup efforts. Adopted the 13th day of July, 2021, endorsed by all five county commissioners. And April, it, 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 unfortunately, it seems no matter how many tons we pull out every year, there, there's more to be collected. Well, yes and no. Um, number one, I'm very honored to be following your Parks and Recreation Group because I feel like what we do enhances all of their efforts. And I've been a part of watching these efforts take place over the past years, and I'm very, you guys have been a great example for our region, so thank you. Um, the 91 tons that we have created, when we first started this event back in 2008, we were averaging about 12 tons the first three years every time. And that average has dropped down to five and a half tons. So it's my goal to work my way out of this job. <laughs> Thought I'd do it in 10. Looks like it might be 20, <laughs> but it's a goal. So we are seeing our numbers go down. Um, last year, despite going completely virtual for a week, we still removed um, 3.5 tons of trash from the waterways. And that was an all self-reporting uh, cleanup that year. And in Indian River County alone, we moved uh, 0.31 tons of trash 82 volunteers and they logged 190 volunteer hours during that time so that was on a virtual so this year we're happy to say we're putting the two concepts together we're going to do the self-reporting week where people can go out on their own using their own supplies and we're very happy to be opening our sites and seeing all our volunteers again this year right. and in indian river county riverside park boat ramp bureau beach municipal marina wabasso causeway boat ramp main street boat ramp and sebastian inlet marina our, our uh, public sites on July 24th and you can register ahead of time or you can um, show up at the site that morning and help us and work for as little or long as you want all ages all right I, I see we have a new volunteer with us this morning this is actually uh, going on a three-year volunteer oh, right, with us, so for her. very well seasoned this is her first <laughs> our proclamation acceptance though all right <laughs> this is Mimi my granddaughter so with that being said, we invite you all to come. If there are any other homeowner groups, it's not too late. If you contact us this week, we can set you up for your own cleanup if you'd like to. And it's very simple, and we've got a pretty good system in place. So thank you, and call me personally if you have any questions. Well, why don't you bring your granddaughter up, and I'll present her with a proclamation. Thank you. <laughs> good. Oh, okay. All right. Great. Here you go. That's for you. Can you take that? Yeah, a girl. All right. Youngest recipient. Thank you. Thank you. Banner. Mm -hmm. 
The next item is a presentation of Indian River County uh, Indicators by Jeffrey R. Uh, Pickering, for President and CEO of Indian River Community Foundation. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and fellow commissioners. Um, my name is Jeff Pickering. I'm the president and CEO of Indian River Community Foundation. I'm here with my colleague, Chika Nuosu, and uh, we're going to share with you a little bit of information about a new resource that we made available for everyone in the community to use. Um, it's called Indian River Indicators. You all set? Okay, good. Okay, so Florida, as you may know, is one of the fastest growing states in the, in the country with nearly a thousand new taxpayers moving to the Sunshine State every day. Indian River County, Florida is one of the most generous communities in the United States with household giving rates nearly double that of the national average. For local donors, however, finding the data and information needed to know that donated time, talent, or treasure is making a real difference can be challenging. This is why three years ago, Indian River Community Foundation partnered with GuideStar, a technology company, to develop our own online nonprofit search to help members of our community to find, learn about, and give directly to local charities here in Indian River County. It's also why we've partnered with Vero Beach Magazine to publish our annual Guide to Better Giving. And while finding information about local charities is now easier, Measuring results about the dollars given to them is still challenging. Until now, no contemporaneous, comprehensive resources existed in Indian River County to indicate where we're making progress and where improvement is needed. Indian River Indicators is a new resource that provides key data and information about our community that is updated annually and that can be used to support and sustain proven programs, it can also be used by community leaders to develop policy and promote promising practices or inspire innovation that can lead to solutions to persistent community challenges. Now, Chiaka is going to navigate us through on the website a little bit about Indian River Indicators and what you can find when you visit there. So Indian River Indicators can be found by simply visiting IRCommunityFoundation.org and clicking Indian River Indicators. and then. To learn a little bit more about it, we'll click About Indian River Indicators. And here you'll see instructions and examples of how to use the dashboard, which are included, as well as a simple index of the various categories of data and information that can be found on this version of the site. And we'll update it annually, so this index will continue to grow. Now, to begin to look at information on what you can actually find about real-time data and information, We'll start with an overview of our community. To begin, uh, here we can find population and other demographic data about Indian River County, such as age, gender, race, English proficiency, people with disabilities, veterans, income, and education. And specific information can also be found about things like the average life expectancy of an Indian River County resident. We can also use uh, certain features like this mapping tool where you can see where disparities exist with life expectancy. If you look on the right side where Chica is hovering her mouse, the dark color section on the beach, and then further west, the lighter section in Gifford, for example, there is a disparity of 12 years life expectancy. If you live on Orchid Island, your average life expectancy can, can be 87 years, whereas if you live in Gifford, the average life expectancy is 12 years less, 75. So people interested in that particular disparity can take a look at this data and information and begin to explore reasons why and develop possible solutions to address this particular challenge. Continuing, let's take a look at the health and prosperity of children. Here we also find population and other demographic data about this community's children. Specific information about preschool, enrollment, and kindergarten readiness can be found. So proven programs like those operated by the Healthy Start Coalition, which has significantly reduced our community's infant mortality rate, <clears throat> child care resources, 
Kindergarten Readiness Collaborative have all contributed to the progress we have seen in these areas. Here you can also see status of third grade English proficiency in our community. Proven programs like those operated by the Learning Alliance and the partners in our community's literacy initiative, the Moonshot Moment, have contributed significantly to this progress. Other information that we don't hear enough about, however, about our community's eighth graders can also be found. If you look at the proficiency in math, last year we were at 64.3% of our eighth graders were proficient in math. And if you think about that compared to the literacy initiative, it might not seem so bad. However, if we take a closer look at this statistic, we can see that there is a significant disparity between the eighth grade math proficiency of white students, which is over 70%, versus those of blacks, where just 30% were ready to go on to Algebra 1 in the ninth grade. Unless remedial measures are taken, 70% of our black ninth grade students will start high school behind when it comes to high school math graduation requirements. Thankfully, at the high school level, we have provided substantial interventions to catch many of these young students up where our high school graduation rates across the board have improved, but there are still an annual class each year, every year, of black students who start ninth grade behind in math. Taking a look at prosperity and the health of adults, we find population and other demographic data about this community's population between ages 19 and then over 65. And as we know from our um, community needs assessment that we produced in 2019, Seniors over the age of 65 are the fastest growing population, percentage of the population in this community. And as an example of some of the information we have on indicators, we can see the overall causes of death for our community's adults and seniors. Leading causes include cancer, heart disease, and accidents. Specifically for seniors who live alone and on their own in their homes, accidents are preventable, but unfortunately when they're left by themselves, can become challenging for our community. Alzheimer's disease also makes the list. Proven programs operated by our Cleveland Clinic, Treasure Coast Community Health, Senior Resources Association, and our Alzheimer Parkinson's Association are working hard to address each of these. Specific information can also be found about economic opportunities, including disparities in pay between genders or races and ethnicities in our community. And so you can see here, when you look at pay disparities between men and women, uh, there's about a $7,000 annual pay disparity between the median earnings in the past 12 months of men in our county versus women. It's about a 30, 30 cents on the dollar differential there between men and women from a median earnings in our community. And then when you look at race and ethnicity, you can see the disparities also exist. Whereas the median earnings of whites in our county over the last 12 months averaged 43,000, whereas Blacks average closer to 16,000. Now whether you're a volunteer, a donor, or a philanthropist, or a public official, or any member of our Indian River County community who is interested in learning more about community needs, the solutions, and ongoing challenges, Indian River indicators can help. I know many times you receive a number of appeals for assistance for organizations, programs, projects, maybe ideas that you could be involved in funding. Many of them are supported with good data and information. I know some of the data and information that my colleague um, Andrea Berry will share today about the Healthy Start Coalition is solid data and information that was supported by research. Other types of information, not so strong. Indian River Indicators is a resource that you can pull up immediately and call into question or at least evaluate and confirm some of the proposals that you'll be seeing in real time. And if you don't find what you need, call us. Chiaca has access to a data library of thousands and thousands of data points that if you don't see it on the dashboard and you're curious about, for example, high school attendance rates within a specific census track in your community, we can actually drill down at that level and find out if the high school attendance rates aren't to our standards, what's going on there. Maybe there's no bus stop. Maybe there are a number of parents uh, who are absent uh, from the home and not supervising children. But the idea behind indicators is to provide better data to help you make more informed decisions 
about your allocation of resources throughout the community. And so that's the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any about this new resource as we launch it in the community. Mr. Chair, I don't have any questions, Jeff. I was just kind of on the site while you were walking through it, and it seems pretty easy to navigate and a lot of information. So thank you all for putting that together. I think it'll be a very uh, useful tool going You're forward. You're welcome. I've had my, uh, my first grader test drive it. And so okay. if he can do it, <laughs> we can do it. Woo! So I'm on the same level with the first grader? Good. I, that's a step up for me. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, yeah, I, I, I appreciate the, this. It's, uh, it, it, it's pretty extensive so far, and I'm sure it's, in, it's still a work in progress for you all as to what you're going to add. or, or uh, it, it will be. I mean, this has been an investment supported by the foundation and some generous philanthropists in the community. The intention for this is to be the go-to site really for anyone looking at allocating a significant amount of resources. If I'm asked by the museum or the Boys and Girls Club to give 100 or or $1,000, I trust the people there and I know the good work that they're doing, but if I'm asked to make an investment of 100000 or a million dollars, this is the kind of data and information that will help somebody make a more informed decision. Oftentimes, when our clients come to the Community Foundation and say, I'd like to address, for example, homelessness and help homeless children, I'm thinking of about a $100,000 gift. We can drill down and tell them if that $100,000 gift will even make a difference. If not, we'll encourage our clients to give more. So oftentimes, it's not so much a gatekeeper as it is leverage to generate more capital for the marketplace to begin to serve the needs of our community. Can we do that in government, Jason, where we put money and make sure it's really going to work there? <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 no, this is awesome. It really is. Y'all should be very proud of it. Uh, it. It's very impressive. It's very clear and concise, and I think it's, uh, it's going to be a valuable tool, and, and maybe it's something that we could include uh, when we maybe get our new website up and running as a link to it or something It's free like and the links that Chia can yeah, pass it on. You yeah, can embed it in your own site and utilize it however you choose. It's very impressive. And again, y'all should be proud of me. You know, you're Thank being, you. I appreciate commended it. highly for it. I, I think it'll be, uh, you know, a, a very good tool for, for everyone to use. Thank you. I'd just like to echo um, everybody's comments. I think, you know, we have a lot of resources in Indian River County. We're very lucky, uh, especially the philanthropic resources that we have. But like anything, there are limits to those. So this really helps um, helps us focus where to put those resources. And I know there's a lot of nonprofits working and doing great work in the community. And this kind of helps address those holes, identify those holes, and we can craft programs around them to address um, these indicators that you brought forward. So data is always a great thing, and having as much data as possible when you're making those types of decisions really helps um, make a, a better program and a better community. So thank you so much for putting this together. It is, it is a wonderful resource, and I, I've been on there, I've checked it out, and I think there's a lot of other people that will, will be checking it out and using it moving forward, Good. so thank, thank you so much. You. Yeah. This is, this is a great tool. Thank you so much for bringing it to us today. It looks, uh, it's, it's a wealth of information, and it looks like it's easy to use, which is a big plus. Thank you. You're welcome. The only thing I hope to do as a lifelong surfer is maybe get the surf report tagged on there at some point. So <laughs> when we do that, my, my job is done. But until then, the resource is there. For All right, now, Jeff, if you're going to do that, you've got to put the dive report on there, too. Uh, okay. okay. All right. All right yeah. so. <laughs> no. Mr. Chairman, commissioners, thank you very much. Thank you so Jason much. Dylan, yeah. Thank you. Next item is a presentation of the fetal and infant mortality report by Andrea Berry, CEO of Indian River County Healthy Start Coalition. Good morning. Good morning. I have something to pass out from Bob. I can just take them, pass them down yeah. for you. There you go. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me today, and I want to thank Jeff for um, acknowledging Healthy Start and the work that we're doing in our community. Um, again, my name is Andrea Berry, and I am the CEO of Healthy Start, Indian River County Healthy Start Coalition um, in Indian River County. So a little bit about um, Healthy Start for those of you that don't know. Thank you so much. Um, we were created 25, actually 30 years ago, by the state of Florida. So at the time, uh, the infant mortality rate in the state of Florida was higher than almost all the other states in the nation. In fact, it was akin to some developing nations. And so 
the governor rather than and the legislature, instead of passing blanket laws and saying, you know, we're just going to do this, we're just going to do that, what they found is that in each community there was different strengths and weaknesses. We know that very well in Indian River County. We have some great strengths, right? So what he did was empower at the local level Healthy Start coalitions. It's our job to monitor what's going on in maternal child health and to make it better. And so that's what we've done. And since that time, we've lowered infant mortality in this state um, to be one of the best. So one of the ways in which we do that is by these fetal infant mortality reviews. So that's what we're going to go over today. And as you see, we've titled this A Mother's Plea. So as I'm going through this work, um, and it's a deep dive into each death that occurred, infant mortality that occurred between the years of 14 and 18. And I'm going to talk about a lot of numbers. But what I, I like to start these presentations the same way we do when we meet is a moment of silence for these families and these babies. Um, you know, as we're talking about a lot of numbers and we're talking about systemic issues, I never want us to lose sight of that this is a mom that will never hold their child. So let's take a moment. Thank you. So, fetal infant mortality review. You're going to hear me refer to this as actually FEMER, uh, which is a, kind of our shortened way of referring to it. But it's a community-led process led by Healthy Start. So, um, it was funded through the hospital district. These are often done in larger communities, funded through the state of Florida. But in our community, we really kind of we thought it was important enough to we needed to do a deeper dive. We needed to figure out what's going on in our community as well. And so thank goodness we have a, an entity that was willing to fund um, this process. They're a great partner. And so I want to give the hospital district their dues for helping us with this. It was a two-year process to study from 14 to 18. We had 26 agencies um, that participated in this, and we met through the pandemic. So we, when we started this process, we actually had a consultant from South Florida come in, and she walked into the first meeting, and the room is packed with all community leaders and people that want to be involved. And she had done studies in Palm Beach County and, and uh, Dade County, and she was just so shocked by how involved people wanted to be at the table to figure this out, to help us figure this out. So it just goes to kudos to our community for how, how much we really care about the families of this community. So we looked at 18 of the 36 deaths that happened during this time period. For our community, an uh, Oak average would be 12 to 20. We did 18, so that's a good, that's a good amount. And we chose those cases that um, had the most robust files, the most complete files, and that mirrored the demographics of the time, uh, the time frame we looked at. So as you can see by this little chart, it's a constant process. So we're data gathering, we're doing the case review, we're doing community action, which is a separate part where we're looking at, we've looked at the causations, now what are we going to do about it? And then implementing the change and then starting it all over again. So now we've completed one cycle and we'll continue on to do more cycles. So as Jeff mentioned, we are very good at data in uh, Healthy Start. So this is something that we, we in this time period, we only did 14 to 18, but I added 19 and 20 because since I've been with Healthy Start five years, we've always, in fact, the last 20 years, the Indian River County birth rate has been right around 1,200 births. We've never gone below. In 2020, we went below 1,200 births for the first time. So it's interesting, and as we get closer in that, this process, we're going to be looking at what happened. We did see a rise in fetal death during this time in 2020, and we know that COVID did, does affect the placenta, so we're looking deeply into those issues as we move forward. So we'll have more answers for you as we go through the next stage. Also, as Jeff mentioned, the news is good when it comes to infant and fetal death in this community. In 2011, unfortunately, our community had one one of the highest rates of infant mortality in the state in 2011. Since that time, we've gone to work, and we've lowered infant mortality and fetal death. So sometimes in communities, you'll see the infant death go down, but at the same time, you'll see a rise in the fetal death. So in that case, public health, that would be a cancelization. We wouldn't consider that real progress. But in our community, we're seeing a decline in both, which is fantastic. 
So these two maps here, you'll see at the one that's 2011, you can see that we're the darker one on the coast, the darkest on the coast. That means that we had the highest rate of infant mortality in 2011. After the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, it takes a couple years for that impact to really take hold. Families have been unemployed for a while, stress, um, excess stressors at home, maybe substance misuse, not able to go to the doctor as much, and we see um, the infant mortality rate rise. And then Healthy Start in our community went to work, and as you see, 2018, one of the lowest. What's great about this map is that you can see that a lot of the communities that were high stayed high. But Indy River County is different because we did a lot of things. We expanded a lot of programs. So in 2008, we only had health education, which is a great program. It's a statewide program, but we leveraged community dollars, we went to work, we added coordinated intake referral, which touches almost every single mom face-to-face. -face. In Partners in Women's Health, 95% of all moms are touched by this program. Babies and Beyond, which provides lactation support bedside, uh, prenatal education classes or childbirth education classes, and we have a nurse, an RN, that goes into every home after a mom has had a baby. She goes into every home and checks mom. That's important because that's when most deaths happen not just the infant deaths, but maternal deaths as well. So we check mom, check baby, um, and we're, that's a program that's really saving lives. Our community doula program, I can't tell you how much attention we're getting for that program statewide. They actually want to bring it statewide right now. Um, it's a, it, we've had tremendous results in lowering cesarean, uh, cesarean and um, early term birth and low birth weight babies. Nurse Family Partnership is a uh, family-based program, home visitation program, evidence-based over 30 years of clinical trials that show that you change the trajectory of a family's life, higher income levels, higher health. And then parents as teachers. And parents as teachers is really our nod to the school readiness and literacy that we've all, we've, as a community, we've been trying to address. And you might think, well, that's a weird thing for a health organization to address, but I'll talk a little bit about the social determinants as we move forward. So you have a full report in front of you guys that you could really pour over and find out more, but the medical causations um, of, that we found when we looked at these deaths pretty much are standard for what we find in our county, state, and national. So that's congenital abnormalities, low birth weight very, uh, or premature birth, respiratory distress, sepsis infection, and suffocation or sleep-related deaths. So that's, those, are not, those are very typical to what we find. But things that are kind of outstanding for our area, things that we look at that are sub-causations would be maternal age. So we did find that um, we had a few deaths on the uh, advanced maternal age, and then also teens. Teen death, death with um, babies born to teens is not typical. But I wanted to highlight that because in our community, we have a high rate of teen birth. We are higher than Brevard, we are higher than St. Lucie, we are higher than Miami-Dade County. We have, a high, we have an issue with this in our community. Cesarean births, we had a 36 rate of cesarean births last year. That's not a great rate. That's, and, but we have a great partner in Cleveland Clinic that recognizes that, and they're working hard to, to minimize that. Preconception health, uh, we had, when we looked at this, so 78% of the women that we looked at said their pregnancy was unplanned or mistimed, but only half were using birth control. And four had reported um, a previous, or only, only four had, had reported that they had preconception health care prior to pregnancy, and three of them had had an infant or fetal loss prior to that. So there's issues with preconception health. So preconception health is anything that's pre when you got pregnant, so just general health, essentially. And then we talk about the social determinants of health, which wealth disparities, education, geographic area, and race and ethnicity. And Jeff touched on some of this, but I do want to, I love this chart, um, because I think that a lot of us want to attribute a lot of our health to our doctor. <laughs> but if you look at this chart, socioeconomic factors, 40%, 30% be health behaviors. And I want to point out that 73% um, of the cases studied, the, the mother had a high school diploma or less. And 44% reported multiple stress factors. 
Also, as far as 78% of the cases were enrolled in Medicaid services. So it shows an economic issue as well. And I, I love this for several reasons, but a lot of it comes down to um, you know, Healthy Start addresses these things. That's why we're so effective. We're addressing socioeconomic factors, we're addressing health behaviors, and we're addressing access to care. So when we kind of whittled down all that information, and for any of you up there, you have the full robust report that you, you can look at, and if you have any questions about that, deeper data, let me know. And for anyone in the audience, it's on our website as well, so you can look at it and find out if you really want to get deep into the numbers. Um, but we took a lot of that data, and we just um, made it three factors that we want to address. So preconception health, awareness and education on issues affecting newborns and new moms, and enhanced care for women with high-risk pregnancies. So I'm going to skim through these. These are kind of where we are on our, these are our plans that we made to address. A lot of this stuff is community work that kind of had to be put on hold a little bit while we were working in COVID, but now we're going to be full steam ahead. Um, but a little, I want to give you some highlights, which is one thing we did do was we created a COVID-proof catalog of videos. So we always have these classes that are prenatal education classes. We have um, CPR classes, we have breastfeeding education classes, all kinds of things that we do are doing in person. And of course, we shifted to doing them online. And now we are do doing both of those things as well. But we also have a catalog of COVID proof videos. So if you're just at home and you're, you know, you're anxious parent and you want to jump online and learn about local issues, local things that are going on here, you can jump on our website and get access to all that information. Uh, enhanced care for women with high-risk pregnancies. I want to highlight a couple things there, which is one, uh, we have completed a maternal opioid recovery effort and in, uh, initiative with Cleveland Clinic, which is a great way to help moms that are substance misusing to really be the best mom that they can be. And um, this is something that we have a great partner in Cleveland Clinic. And another thing I want to highlight for them is they are able to bring maternal fetal medicine to our area, which we've never had before. So a mom that was having a high-risk pregnancy was either working with the fantastic doctors here, but maybe a little out of their scope, or driving to West Palm or to Stewart or to Orlando to see a doctor that were, that were able to address their issues. But now we have a doctor that comes to Vero, so moms don't have to go that far, you know, drag their children sometimes and miss work and the whole thing. So I want to give kudos that, they, that they're doing that too. So that's addressing that high risk. And the, the last thing I want to highlight is, um, you know, we saw that surge in 2011. And it takes a couple of years for this stress to take hold of these families, the real po and po poverty out income to, you know, to um, kick in, maybe they're stressed and their substance misusing or maybe their nutrition is is uh, suffered and so i'm we've come so far and i'm looking at what's going to happen in the next couple of years what will be happening in 2022 2021 with infant and fetal death so in looking at when we do have a financial crisis what are the long-term implications so short-term impl implications increased poverty poor nutrition um, low investment in health and education, uh, loss of social and family cohesion, but the long-term implications, regression of developmental indicators, poverty traps, and reversal of progress. And that's what I'm afraid of. We've come so far to help these sweet babies, to make sure that parents see their babies blow out that first birthday candle and that first birthday cake. And I don't want to see us slide back. So I just want to make everyone here aware that this is a po potential possibility and we can't stop doing what we're doing. We have to keep going. And uh, now that we are seeing the light outside of COVID, we have to continue and we might have to do a little bit more. So I just wanted to share that information with you. And if you guys have any questions, I'm so happy to answer. Mr. Troop, I'm, uh, Andrea, have you seen a, a, an issue with, with infant addiction to opioids after they're born are y'all dealing with that very much with if the mother was you know an opioid user so if if it, so we have a great we have great providers here and if the doctors are identified uh that mom is substance misusing they typically will try to get her to um give birth somewhere where there's a NICU we don't have a NICU in in any river county 
Um, so if baby's born and there is a true issue, so they'll try to give, get her to give birth either at St. Mary's or Orlando or even, um, yeah, or in Atlanta, Whitney Palmer. So that's, um, but yeah, we, we do see, especially we've seen an upsurge in, in substance misuse with COVID for sure. Um, and we haven't, um, we don't have the data for that yet. I will soon. But um, anecdotally, what we're seeing when we go into the community is more and more use. So, yes. I appreciate what y'all do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Th thank you so much. I mean, what you do is so comprehensive and, and so critical uh, for the future of our, our county. And I, and I want to thank you, too. When I was working on the, um, the small nonprofit grant assistance, you were very encouraging and supportive right from the start. So it's not just your own endeavors, which are uh, critical and very important, but you also care about uh, the other nonprofits in the county. So thank you very much. Yeah. Well, it's a group effort, and we have an amazing... We have an amazing group of people that care deeply about our citizens, and they do a lot. And um, so, yeah, I would I would uh, be happy to speak for them. And I really want to thank you all, and staff, and everyone. All that you do is very important. And it was just as hard for you during COVID, getting through all this stuff. So thank you for all that you do as well. Thank you. Thank you. Right. And if you ever have any questions about data with uh, maternal and child health, I'm happy to come back at any time. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you for that. And then the next item is the informational items. Uh, we do have a uh, planning and zoning uh, commission vacancy. Uh, Harry Howell has, uh, District 5 has uh, submitted his resignation. Uh, and that's uh, district sensitive to Yes, um, th thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to take a moment to thank Mr. Harry Howe for, for his service, and I hope to have a replacement by our next regular meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moss. And yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, Kim, could you call up the flyer, please? The uh, career source is um, working with United Against Poverty to host a job fair. It'll be this Thursday. Um, and the location is right down the street from the county building here across from Lowther uh, Crematory. Um, and, the, and the important thing here is if you notice on the bottom there, the veterans um, have an early uh, entry at, at half hour before the other um, applicants. It allows the veterans to get in and, and talk to the hires um, first thing. So just uh, if anybody out there, if you know if they're looking for a job, that uh, this job fair is going to be this Thursday from 3 to 6 at the United Against Poverty Center. And uh, thank you for that, Mr. Chairman. And there are uh, plenty of jobs available. Uh, something to do about some kind of federal income that prevented people from wanting to go to work. Uh, so there are a lot of opportunities out there, and we hope that people respond to this job fair. Thank you. We'll move on to the consent agenda. Commissioners? There are a few items. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, I'd like to pull item 8N as in Nancy. 8N November. And 8P as in Paul. And 8P as in Papa. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to pull 8R as in Roger. N, P, N, R. Okay. Is there anything else? Is there anybody in the audience that wishes to have any one of the consent agenda items pulled for further clarification, discussion, debate? Seeing none, Kim, do you have anybody on the internet? Move to approve consent as amended. Upon motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Adams. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Thank you. First item to be pulled was item in November. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is um, an item um, looking for approval for a new diabetes management program. And I'd just like to see if Suzanne Boyle can come in and talk to it a little bit. Um, and and Suzanne, I'll let you summarize where, where we are and what we're going with this, and I'll, I'll have my question for you Absolutely. after you review it, please. Boyle, Human Resources Director. Um, so the program that's uh, under consideration today is a, 
program that's um, changing from what's been in place since 2016. Back in 2016, Indian River County entered into a relationship with Connect to provide diabetes management uh, supplies and voluntary coaching for those individuals who wanted some assistance with uh, managing their uh, diabetic condition. Uh, this program that is currently in place will not be offered uh, at the end of this plan year. So Connect uh, presented a proposal to us for um, a replacement program, which is an increased cost. It's also an increased uh, service. So uh, what we would uh, be receiving is um, uh, more proactive coaching, uh, where Connect would actually receive claims from our uh, claim system to be able to identify people who, who would fall into the category of needing support for managing diabetes. Um, those individuals who wanted to enroll in this program would uh, receive their diabetic supplies at no cost. The cost to the county would be $70 per enrollee per month. And uh, then the change is that the participation for coaching and management of the condition would be uh, mandatory. It wouldn't be just voluntary where somebody would get the supplies and then if they wanted support um, of a coach and uh, uh, assistance with lifestyle changes, uh, they would actually be required to enroll in the full program. The reason this is beneficial to us is that it takes the program to the next step of being able to provide the type of guidance and support that someone who's managing a chronic condition might need to be successful and actually have improved outcomes over time. Um, so the investment is higher than what we're paying today, but the return on investment is expected to be greater than what we would realize just through um, providing people with diabetic supplies. And so it's uh, presented to you for consideration. Okay, very, uh, thank you, Suzanne. And so like currently, um, according to the backup, we have 83 participants using the, um, just our prescription benefit under our health plan where they do have some copay. Is that? That's correct. Okay. And then we have 25 folks participating at zero member cost in the full coaching program. It's, it's not a full coaching program, but there is coaching that's available, but it's it's elective okay. currently. So then um, looking at if we approve this plan, the 25, say the 25 participants go sign up for the coaching and we're paying 70 bucks a month for each of them at 12 months is 21,000 a year. But because there's a minimum, we're paying 42,000 a year. There is so, a minimum $3,500. Right. So that... So we're, we're paying more than the actual people that we got signed up. As of today, yes. Right. So what do we have uh, planned for to try to increase that number from 25 to get some of those 83 into the coaching program? Do we have a, a strategy for that? Or? Yes, yes. Uh, Connect would deploy their strategy that they typically uh, utilize when providing this type of a service. Uh, we would be sharing claims data. They would be able to do um, outreach to individuals who uh, might currently be receiving their medication through the pharmacy benefit mm -hmm. and be able to um, say, hey, we're here. You can receive your services, um, uh, your diabetic supplies free, saving the member, the the member copay. And also, right. okay. this is how we're going to support you. And the, the other thing that's really great about this is um, diabetes you can also have other conditions with your diabetes. Right. So um, the uh, uh, high blood pressure, um, uh, maybe uh, weight issues Obesity, and things right. like mm -hmm. that. So what's really great about that is Connect will also identify those other conditions and provide resources and assistance to, um, you know, the blood pressure cuff, uh, a scale, and then help that person make lifestyle choices that will help them on their journey to health. Okay. Okay, very good. I, I appreciate that additional information. Sure. Um, Mr. Chairman, on item 8N, uh, recommend go ahead and approve staff recommendation. Second. Uh, upon motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Ehrman. Any further discussion? Susan, thank you for the You're clarification. Welcome. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Thank you. 
Next item, uh, item P. Papa. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, this one I just pulled to um, point out the fact this is where we um, have these um, veteran affairs supportive housing vouchers, and there was a um, another county that had a voucher that they couldn't utilize, so they actually they're transferring that voucher to Indian River County, which will allow us to um, help another another veteran. So I just want to thank staff, uh, Phil and Robin Miller, or Phil Matson and Robin Miller, um, for putting this together. And also I think Bill DeBraw was involved. Um, just, you know, just one more little thing we're doing to help the veterans, and it may only be one voucher, but that's one more than we had. So I um, want to appreciate everybody's work on that. And with that, uh, move uh, staff recommendation. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Item R. Romeo. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this item had to do with the uh, feasibility study for uh, $992,100, and I had voted against it in that it required uh, waiving the requirement for bids, so there were no bids. So I'm, I'm still uh, not in favor of this. So Mr. Chairman, I move approval of item 8R. Second. Upon motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Adams. Not sure I did. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? I'm opposed. Motion carries four to one with Commissioner Moss dissenting. Well, that uh, clears up all of our consent agenda items. And we'll move on to uh, public discussion, which is a request to speak from Doug Smith, South Beach Area Residents Group, regarding water and sewer services and rates affecting residents of South Beach Area. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Good morning. Chairman. Uh, my name is Doug DeMuth, and uh, this morning, uh, Lori Barkhorn, the uh, president of Seascape uh, Property Owners Association will be speaking on behalf of our group. So, Lori? It's on. Just need to make it Thank you, Doug. Well. You just got to get a little closer. It's I'm directional. Good swing morning. it towards you. Can you, you. Hmm? Can you hear me? Just swing right. it towards you. It'll work. More like this? Yes. Thank there you, you sir. Appreciate it. Okay, as uh, Doug said, I'm Laurie Barkhorn. I'm actually uh, the HOA president at Seagrove on the east side. I know, you're always calling up something else. Thank you very much for having us here today. I'm speaking here as a representative of a coalition of leaders from the county's South Beach area. Our coalition represents about 70% of the residents of South Beach and a significant percentage of the county's registered voters on the barrier island. This group has formed organically out of interest in the issue of the sewer and water ownership and rates. While informal, we expect the group will remain in good communication on these and other issues of concern to the residents, and perhaps we might also be helpful to you as you already have been to us. To date, we have been working to fact find on the issue of the sewer and water ownership and rates. We've met with various representatives here um, in order to excuse me, in order to gain greater knowledge about the costs, the decision-making processes, future investments, and capabilities so that we can offer our voice where appropriate. Jason Brown and his team, as well as the chairman, have been kind enough to meet with us, and we have a scheduled meeting with Commissioner Moss next week as well, and thank you for all that you've done to help educate us on, on these issues. We've met as well with city officials on this issue. Our goal in speaking here today is to make our requests clear and on the record, we have five items that we'd request. First, we would like long-term, transparent, simple, and competitive rates for the services provided. The city recently met with us, and in that meeting, they discussed their one-rate concept, which would eliminate some of the uh, surcharges, franchise fees, equalization charges, and such that are rather confusing to the taxpayer residents and instead focus on a more consumer-friendly, understandable um, set of items like the product cost itself and usage charges. These seem like good goals, provided they are achieved at reasonable rates. The city also recently outlined a potential path to their stated monthly water rate increase of $17.66 per customer. 
They stated this would occur over 10 years, inclusive of plant, renewal, and replacement of pipes, replaced water lines, new tankage, et cetera. We are currently working to get this commitment that they stated to us in our meeting in writing. What we would like from our county representatives is your commitment to an outcome for us that includes this long-term transparent and competitive rates regardless of the provider, whether the provider is the city, Indian River County, another county, or indeed a private entity. Second, we would like long-term agreements that are clear as to their terms, provide for accountability, and are binding regardless of changes in the personnel enforcing them. Over the fact finding that we have done, we have observed the expiration of a franchise agreement, differing interpretations of some existing agreements, and at times, a lack of responsiveness between the city and the county. These disputes, along with the confusion around some of those items like the franchise fees and equalization charges, can breed a little bit of lack of trust from the residents and taxpayers. The county can help here by ensuring clear, timely, and binding agreements. Third, we would like the county's support for the unincorporated South Beach area in general. If the county continues to use providers like the city to offer services, we expect the county to support the constituents of our area should challenges need to be made at times now or in the future. We do need your support to us should a dispute arise with the city or another provider that we can't you contract with. We would not want to be left to our own defense in such a situation. Fourth, we also seek the county's assistance with potential agreements and potential legislation. We've become aware of certain agreements that might need to be enforced or reduced to clear writing, statutes that could be amended, and other documentation that absent action might create some obstacles to successful negotiation and interpretations in the future. We'd ask that these be considered for support, and we will uh, take these up in future meetings with you as well. Fifth, and perhaps more generally, we'd like to see more of a future-oriented focus that's shared with the residents. As taxpayers, we believed we are owed consistent, agile, and proactive representation. This, issue, this particular issue has brought to light some concern that as residents, we are not routinely seeing the exploration that you may or may not be doing of alternatives that would create greater efficiency for us as taxpayers. At this point, to be frank, we are actually simply having difficulty obtaining the cost picture from the city and others, even just for the current plans, um, much less any alternatives that might be out there in the, in the public or private sector for the services that we're paying for here. Water and wastewater treatment are critical commodities right now where technology and invention are moving very quickly and there are likely opportunities that we should all not miss out on. We do ask you to continue to explore these and share this information with the taxpay taxpayers as you do. I want to um, final, finally say thank you for all the work that you do. It's very evident even being here at one portion of one meeting, seeing the breadth of everything that you do for our, for our county and for our individuals, and we appreciate your time on that as well as our issue. Well, thank you for your uh, input, request, and kind words. You, uh, we will continue to do that, and we have discussed at, at the meetings that uh, we will go forward, and uh, every one of those requests that you're making now happen at a different time, uh, and uh, we have been working them. Actually, uh, our county administrator has been working them, uh, and there has been uh, several discussions uh, with the politics removed. Indeed. And uh, there will be a time where it will escalate to uh, various levels, and uh, you will be very much taken into consideration and part of it. And I can turn it over to uh, Jason Brown if uh, he wished to just give a few words on this. Sure. Yes. Thank you, Lori. Thanks, Doug, for coming down and for your involvement in this. Um, we definitely see ourselves as as the the as needing to represent the South Barrier Island property owners um, in the utility issues. We are going through the dispute resolution process with the city right now, who has um, initiated that, which is the the process where they would begin 
uh, to sue the county over over this service territory as well as Indian River Shores. Um, we are working with them to try to um, ensure that we have a new franchise with the city um, that would provide those competitive transparent rates to the uh, to the South Barrier Island uh, folks. They seem to be receptive of that. We do have an the next meeting, or that meeting was continued to uh, July 22nd. So uh, next Thursday, we will continue on with that. Our hope is that um, the city was receptive to our proposal, it seemed, at the last meeting. Uh, and our key things there are trying to provide some rate protection for the uh, for the South Bear Island residents. I'll just go through it very briefly. We've requested to continue with county rates through 2027, which is the time that the initial term of the Indian River Shores Agreement uh, terminates. Um, and then from there, uh, we have, we have um, stated that we would request a five-year rate protection where uh, they could go to city rates following 2027, but they could not increase rates by more than 5% a year for a five-year time period. And thereafter, they would only be able to charge those residents the same rates charged by uh, charged to city residents with no outside service charges that, uh, that are allowed via Florida statute. Um, and then also some things to ensure that they provo that, that, that South Bear Island residents and unincorporated residents overall are receiving the same level of service um, in addition to meeting certain industry standards, um, also receiving the same level of service as city residents. So we keep, uh, keep working to that end. Um, we welcome you guys to continue to participate in the process, be happy to continue information sharing. Um, I've heard you on the uh, challenges with getting information from the city. We'll, we'll definitely work with you on that as well. We appreciate that, and Jason specifically, we would we would like to meet with you sometime before the twenty second meeting, if that's possible. So you'll be hearing from us. Okay, yeah, just just try to set something up thank with uh, Tina. Okay, thank, thank you, thank you. Very much. Appreciate Mr. It. Chairman. Yes. Yeah, um, just to follow up a little bit with that, um, the the utility business is getting very complicated and technical and and not only from that point of view but also from a legislative point of view as a matter of fact in our budget workshop tomorrow i think we're adding two or three positions in the utility department just to chase down some of the new legislation we're being required uh, to put in so just kind of an overall caveat you know water and sewer rates are going to have to go up over time just because our cost to provide that service is going up as Jason outlined, we're, we're trying to give you all some protection from that and make sure that you don't pay more than what the city residents pay. So we, we are working on that, but rates will go up inevitably, inevitably because just the, the cost of providing that service is going up. Um, secondly, I think it's well known that the city is talking about moving their um, sewer treatment plant off the lagoon. And we have encouraged the city, you know, saying, hey, listen, It'd be really helpful if you guys nailed down the exact cost, told us how you're going to pay for it, and then how that might impact the, the rates going forward. Um, and we haven't really gotten that back from them, but we have encouraged them to try to get that number, as, as you said, um, transparency for us going forward so we know what, what's down the road. So we have been working on that and trying to get that information as well. So I kind of feel your pain there. We would like to know as well, and, um, but we're, we'll keep working with them. We, we appreciate that it's a it's a rather enormous cost and, oh absolutely yeah um, and and as we stated one of the things that we really are seeking here is what are the alternatives um, right. and and uh, looking for ways that we can reduce those costs absolutely yeah okay thank, thank you. you very much for the can relate from round one in the discussion there uh, some of that original commitment uh, has been a little more clarified and the information is a little more embracing some of the initial requests that we had made uh, that were were made uh, are far more challenging as uh, uh, vice chairman o'brien is uh, indicating that it's getting very complicated but we are committed to ensure that no matter where it comes from you're going to get quality water and you won't have to refinance the home to pay for the water bill okay we're committed to you we appreciate that. And, and to that end, on the you know the city did have an analysis done regarding the impact of the movement of the of the wastewater plant on their rates. They did provide us a copy with that. We've got I, I've got a lot of questions on that. I will say they in the in the assumptions they were talking about the, uh, a required rate increase for city customers. It was silent as to Indian River Shores and 
unincorporated area customer. So my question for that is, does that assume no rate change, the same rates as the city customers or some other rates? So we need to get that information locked down so that we can, so that we can know it and then, and, and, and more importantly, the residents can know it. So we're, we're working on that with you. Yes, we appreciate your partnership in that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending. I know it's been uh, uh, a little while. So we're going to take a brief recess, and then we'll get back to all the public speaking. And I realize that it will be a little, it may be a little lengthy. So I just want to give everybody opportunity. Thank you.
This meeting will now be called back to order. I know everyone enjoyed the brief recess, and we had a chance to talk amongst our seating neighbors, and uh, thank you for all of that. That was a great exchange. But now we're back to the meeting, and uh, before we get started with public speaking, uh, two items. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to uh, call upon the sheriff of Indian River County, who has just arrived and would like to say a few words. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. I appreciate you giving me time today. I know that you have an item on the agenda today about the uh, Second Amendment, about a proclamation, and um, I, I, I appreciate you getting me moved up. Uh, for many who know, I, I'm battling some kidney stone problems right now, so I appreciate uh, you, you getting me to the head of the line. Thank you. Um, I do want to say, and I've said it uh, to, to other groups, but as long as I'm your sheriff, uh, there are no concerns about your local law enforcement coming to take your guns. And I want to make that. I want to make that abundantly clear. Um, and I certainly appreciate uh, that, that you guys uh, have a discussion today uh, about a proclamation for uh, protecting our Second Amendment rights. I think when we have this discussion, it's critically important to talk about the history of the Second Amendment. The fact that our forefathers found it so important to put it as number two only second to free speech. Um, I, I find it so important to recognize as I stand here representing the government that the origins of this Second Amendment was to protect the citizens from a tyrannical government. And so to have government that recognizes that right of the people to protect themselves from the government it is so critically important to me. All the other conversations that happen uh, about, you know, uh, you know we, get it, we get off topic about why we, we have this right. Uh, but at the end of the day, the purpose of the Second Amendment is that our citizens have the right to bear arms to protect themselves from a government that begins to overreach and encroach on their rights. And uh, I can't support that enough. I'm proud that our community has come together uh, to support this in so many ways. And to have a proclamation from this board um, for our citizens recognizing that right uh, would make me very happy. So I thank you for your time. And uh, I thank you for your attention to this. And I thank you for your support of the Second Amendment. Sheriff, thank you for those words, and uh, you're so right. Um, the Second Amendment uh, was uh, placed just right after that first one, and it's because they needed the First Amendment so they can talk about the Second Amendment. That's why it's first. Uh, and, and then, of course, uh, they, had to, they wanted the right to prayer, and they wanted to be able to write and, uh, and gather. So they had to do all that before the Second Amendment, and I think that's the only reason. The Second Amendment is uh, quite uh, the powerful tool. Most people, uh, if they had to recite or look at the first ten amendments to our Constitution, the greatest nation on earth, they would not be able to do it past five. And just think about it for a moment, folks just the right to, to gather and practice your, your religion uh, w without government and be able to speak and write without government is a very powerful tool. The Second Amendment to bear arms, a well-regulated militia. Does anybody know what that means? Okay. That's you. You are regulated. And as far as the, the rest of the debate of the Second Amendment, there are many. Uh, and it's still open for discussion, and that's why we're all here. The Third Amendment, uh, I don't think anybody's concerned about quartering British soldiers into their homes. But uh, w when you had that little skirmish up in uh, Washington, uh, they had to quarter some sol soldiers. They had a lot of soldiers and they put them in a parking garage because we don't have that 
ability to place them in your home without your permission and authority. That's a wonderful, powerful tool. And the Fourth Amendment, of course. You can't sneak and peek and get into your home and get into your pockets and get into your, your lives without warrant. Very powerful. And the fifth, of course, you would not bear witness upon yourself uh, if you deemed it uh, unnecessary to do so. But after that, nobody looks at any of the other, well, maybe speedy trial, uh, for those who might have had the opportunity to review that one. But uh, we have a great nation and a great, uh, a great set of amendments to our Constitution that were created before the 1800s. I just want to say something about, um, you know, we, we talk about different levels of weapons and everything's open for opportunity, uh, for discussion. When you want to look at what, what were the weapons at the time when this, this document was created, muskets and the very first uh, design of a rifled uh, rifle, is that that's what was out there. Do you realize that just after that there was probably the, the deadliest wars and conflicts on those primitive weapons? right here on our grounds, known as the Civil War, and that people were taking their own well-regulated re militia to have to defend their churches, their abilities to speak, and their abilities to have life, and people lost entire families with musket balls. So when we talk about weapons, we have to talk about the right to bear arms. Just that's it. So with that, uh, you know, I know that you all wanted to speak, and I am anxious. I know my colleagues are anxious to hear all of the requests to speak, and you've sat down and been patient, and we've just heard the sheriff, and I heard the response. With that, um, colleagues, while I, I want to hear every bit of the presentation, I'd like the opportunity to move my item a little further forward to this point so we can get this accomplished. Mr. Chairman, um, you're referring to your item 14A1, yes, which is a, an agenda item that we can take action on. So it'd be my pleasure to go ahead and move approval of your recommendation to designate Indian River County a Second Amendment sanctuary. Vice Chairman O'Brien, um, I, I would be honored to second my motion or your motion for my motion in lieu. Um, I would also like to include uh, this document, if it's passed, that it is forwarded to Governor Ron DeSantis for review as we will be if this passes, we will be the 44th, 45th, 45, look at that, 45th, <laughs> the 45th county in the state of Florida to move resolution in this manner, and I believe that uh, he would be anxious to know that we have done this. Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd be glad to add that, but I think also we would send it to Representative Grawl and Senator, Senator Mayfield and uh, Congressman Posey. Just Absolutely. cover our cover our delegations. God bless America. Second, second, so amended. Any further discussion? Um, I just had a question. This is for the uh, for our attorney. Uh, the last uh, whereas it reads whereas the fast protectors of the U.S. Constitution, is, is, should that be a uh, last protector or first protector? It sounds like it might be um, not, not the correct word. Um, I, I will defer to the, the chair and the drafter of this. I, I didn't Yes, it is, it, it is. That is the typo, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And that, that will so, be corrected and clarified. What, so what, 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 what word will it be then? The, the first protectors. The first protectors. Okay. All right. So we're ch so we'll change that to first. Thank you. Any further discussion? I know you're going to speak. 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carried unanimously. Resolution is passed. Thank you. Thank you. It's been uh, quite a few months of, of discussion and input, and uh, I, I want to say that uh, most of the requests that uh, requested to speak were very much part of it and have given great insight and input, and I apologize that we delayed this to this point but there were some reasons to do that to ensure that everything was well thought out. I want you to know that I reviewed over 40, 40 documents that I don't believe were any much appropriate for Indian River County. There were just maybe two or three that fit us, fit you the people of Indian River County. So with that in mind, it did take some time. All right, I was a slow reader but I looked at every one of them. And some of them, I don't know. I will tell you this though, they all pass on the first, first swipe. So, and I, I think there's more to come. Well, with that, uh, we do have uh, requests. Yeah. Well, I And I, I thank you, uh, Mr. Westcott, uh, Counselor. Uh, we will be uh, discussing that, and I will uh, defer to the county attorney. Uh, however, um, I did want to uh, give all the people the opportunity to speak that uh, took the time to request to speak, and I know they have great input. But uh, with that, uh, well, we can answer that question. Uh, very, very swiftly, and I will have the county attorney explain that before we go further. Sure, uh, thank you. Um, basically, Florida statute section 790.33 specifically states that except it is provided in the state constitution or general law that the legislature hereby declares that it is occupying the whole field of regulation of firearms and ammunition, including the purchase, sale, transfer, taxation, manufacture, ownership, possession, storage, and transportation thereof to the exclusion of all existing and future county, city, town, or municipal ordinances or any administrative regulations or rule adopted by the local uh, or state government relating thereto. Um, thus, and it says any existing ordinances, rules, or regulations are hereby declared null and void. Additionally, uh, a violation of this section of Florida statutes comes with a specific fine, uh, a, a civil fine of up to $5,000 against each uh, and against the elected and appointed local officials uh, whose jurisdiction in which the violation occurs. So the safest bet under the Florida statute is to make sure that there is not an ordinance that is passed. However, such resolution is certainly acceptable. And for further clarification, I refer to the documents that I read as documents, as they were resolutions. They were not ordinances. And uh, that was one of the difficult patterns that, that we had to discuss. I understand that uh, some members of the public felt that this was something with lesser teeth. No, it's not lesser teeth. It clearly states our intention, our abilities, our commitment, and our support of our sheriff who we would not be funding any furtherance of any federal decision that gets made. And it's kind of very, very similar to some of the other enactments that the federal government has made that we would not be taking your money, your taxpayer dollars, and supporting the sheriff to be able to go forward. And at, uh, at a, a meeting where I uh, had the opportunity to discuss it with the sheriff, when he said that clearly, that's what struck the note, that we will not be committing tax dollars to him to ensure that the federal government's wishes or interpretation get resolved. They can do that on their dime and on their time. Thank you. With that, uh, we do have a request to speak uh, from uh, L Lamar 
Nota Giacomo uh, and a request for support for the Second Amendment resolution. I think that's granted, but uh, please come forward. Well, thank you so much, members of the commission and members of the public, who some, some of who left work to be here. Um, we're just ecstatic and delighted, and we just appreciate you up, upholding our constitutional rights. Um, here I've got over uh, probably 1,600 um, signed petitions from the public in support of the Second Amendment uh, sanctuary in Indian River County. And um, I, I showed them to most of you. However, Commissioner Moss did not see them, so I would like for her to see them when I'm done. And um, I'll be brief, forgive me if I'm redundant, but we're, I'm so grateful that we live in this county, that um, we have commissioners that respect our constitutional rights, and to have a sheriff who also respects our constitutional rights. So, um, uh, where do I start? Okay, I've lived in Indian River County for 20 years, and um, in 2020, several of our members created a petition and began collecting signatures at gun shows with the goal of making Indian River County a Second Amendment sanctuary. We continued petition gathering in 2021 and recognized the need to form a grassroots group specifically for issues related to the Second Amendment. As we expanded our petition drive to other local events such as Downtown Friday, it became abundantly clear that public sentiment is in support of this resolution. Our members have collected over 1,500 signatures to date Okay, you've already, you've already been over that. Paragraph two of the United States Declaration of Independence is unambiguous in its description of the protective role of government regarding our inalienable rights. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Our God-given constitutionally enumerated rights, including the right to keep and bear arms, are nonpartisan, belonging to every American citizen. An extensive analysis done by law and economics professor John R. Lott in 1998 entitled More Guns, Less Crime proves conclusively that a well-armed citizenry deters crime. This study received the endorsement of Milton Friedman, James Bovard from the Wall Street Journal, and Peter Coy of Business Week. The, the analysis proved that encouraging citizens to be well-trained and armed is in the best interest of all members of the community. Other grassroots groups standing in solidarity with us today include We the People IRC, the Freedom Coalition, Defend Florida IRC, the Sebastian Warriors, Moms for Liberty, and several others, as well as many individuals. We're humbled and grateful for their support. And um, just thank you very much for approving this resolution to uphold and protect our, our Second Amendment rights and if everybody in here would stand up if you're here to support the second amendment resolution thank you very much thank you <laughs> next time is request to speak by paul westcott for regarding the Second Amendment resolution. Good morning, Counselor. Good morning. Thank you very much for what you've done. Um, first of all, to amplify Mr. Reingold's point of view, had you advanced an ordinance, I would be here telling you don't do it. So I appreciate that you're following Florida law and you're doing the right thing. I appreciate that you're doing the right thing by joining the company of some really great people. Um, our, our Bill of Rights was ratified by uh, Congress in 19, uh, 1791 by largely the same men who wrote the Constitution who participated in the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence tells us why we had the Constitution, um, but these were great men, and, and you have uh, agreed with them. And, and we frequently, when we have uh, conversations about gun rights, those who are advocating for the Second Amendment can be marginalized. And, and uh, we tend to forget that, that you know, Thomas Jefferson was the inspiration for the uh, Bill of Rights. Samuel, uh, James Madison was the primary author. And I just want to share one quick quote and, uh, and amplified some of the points that uh, uh, com uh, Commissioner Flesher has made um, and that uh, our sheriff made. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. A well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people trained to arms is the best and most natural defense of a free country. That's James Madison. 
okay? That's the very government that he's referring to that they had just created with the formation of the Constitution. We don't, we don't remember or put those two together, that they wrote the Second Amendment in reference to the government that they had just created. They saw the connection, and you do too, and I appreciate what you've done. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor. And finally, we have uh, a request to speak by Jeff Bassesso regarding the Second Amendment resolution. Good morning, sir, and thank you for your service. Morning, I am Jeff Massesso, a county resident and a Navy submarine veteran. I have the honor of prior community service too with our sheriff's office as a volunteer special deputy. And I thank Sheriff Flyers for his support of our resolution, the deputies for their service, and all Florida sheriffs for the 2013 proclamation supporting our right to keep and bear arms. I rise for the team to demonstrate our fellow citizens' overwhelming support for their second amendment, where it matters most, responsible firearms owners, exercising that right in safe and lawful ways. I prepared the document that you have for review and I'd like to do some updates and emphasize on some of that. Just uh, quickly, some, some numbers. County fairground gun show attendees, about 2,500 to 3,500 estimated per show, representing thousands of responsible firearms owners exercising their right to keep and bear arms. Sebastian public shooting range users, 130,742 as of July 12th, representing tens of thousands of responsible firearms owners safely exercising their right to keep and bear arms. The range was a very successful grassroots uh, effort in cooperation with the county commissioners at that time. Indian River County concealed carry licenses, licensees. 22,555 as of June 30th, representing about 18.5% of those 18 years or older, which includes the age group that would carry concealed. These numbers continue to grow, by the way. 178,937 concealed carriers in our immediate area, if you add the surrounding four counties. That's quite a number. Numbers again, 2.49 plus million Florida concealed carriers as of June 30th and 93% of those carriers are citizens and retired law enforcement officers. Women comprise about, women comprise now 29% of licensees, and those numbers are continuing to grow. And on this graph here, you can see a record 362,000 plus new concealed weapons license, license applications made in fiscal year 2020, 2021, which continues a strong upward trend on this uh, on their graph all of these activities represent many hundreds of thousands of florida responsible firearms owners lawfully exercising their right to keep and bear arms our citizens are not only exercising their second amendment rights they are also in its spirited and proper defense dutifully and lawfully exercising their first amendment right to assemble peace, peacefully, and to petition government for a redress of grievances. Please consider these actions. Let me throw this up. Okay. Because of citizens' grassroots efforts that we here represent today, 44 of 67 Florida counties, 66%, have adopted pro-Second Amendment resolutions to protect that right. Second Amendment counties on this map and the next one are shaded green. And the last one. Fifteen states now have passed Second Amendment protective measures at the state level. There are now 1,930 counties with resolutions or protections representing over 61% of the nation. And on this map here, I'd like to point out something interesting. Many counties in not so Second Amendment states, like Virginia, Illinois, Michigan, Washington, Oregon, 
they're all going Second Amendment green. You can see them on the map there. And to me, this is the best Green New Deal I have seen so far. <laughs> and recently, Utah's 29 sheriffs have pledged to protect their citizens' Second Amendment rights, stating, quote, unquote, we hereby recognize the significant principle underlying the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms is indispensable to the existence of a free people. And lastly, please consider this recent activity. The 2021 legislative session passed House Memorial 1301, a memorial to Congress of the United States, be it resolved by the legislator of the state of Florida. That is the consensus of the Florida legislature that the president's proposals to restrict the right to keep and bear arms of law-abiding citizens violates the Constitution of the United States. Be it further resolved that the Florida legislature on behalf of the state of Florida and residents of this state intends to use all of its lawful authority and power to resist or overturn any federal gun control measure that violates the right of Florida residents to keep and bear arms. And I believe we're on a track to becoming a secondary, uh, Second Amendment sanctuary state. In closing, increasing numbers of U.S. counties and states have passed Second Amendment protective measures to secure this right of the people from federal overreach. Tens of thousands of responsible Florida firearms owners and millions of Florida's lawful concealed carriers have demonstrated that their right to keep and bear arms is to be exercised. 66% of Florida counties have proclaimed their citizens' right to keep and bear arms is to be protected. And I would say I therefore request our commissioners unanimously adopt this resolution to declare an Everett County a Second Amendment sanctuary in harmony with the many Florida counties that have already done so. Thousands of responsible citizen firearms owners here exercising their right to keep and bear arms are counting on you to protect it. And I thank you that you did. Any questions? Thank you. Any questions? Uh, well, well, Jeff, I, I, I think uh, I just want to add that it was a pleasure to meet you a while back, and we had a, a very nice discussion at the gun show, and uh, uh, we talked about this, and I knew that there was going to be some navigation, but I said we would definitely want to consider it. And uh, having been the concerns, and we also discussed, and it was just brought up, no, I am not an NRA member. Uh, I have, uh, and it's not about guns, although uh, I have uh, been quite familiar with weapons since the early 80s due to my occupation and uh, whereabouts we were at, uh, but, uh, and continue to do so. Uh, but I, w I will say that uh, it was very supportable and it just had to be explored a little further and it had to be ripe for movement uh, with uh, certain considerations, including the statute that we could not have a true ordinance but I think this is a very powerful tool, and I want to thank you for being the person who came to me first and talked about it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Commissioners. We appreciate it. <clears throat> Jeff, if I would add, I, I, I do appreciate uh, the information that you had. And it was it, it, not, incredible. I mean, you know, I think you already knew where I stood on this anyways, but I do appreciate the information. But, but I do think we, uh, we need to thank Mr. Westcott for for, uh, for all his work and yes and in uh, in navigating this through the through the through the turns and the curves that it takes so I thank both of you guys very thank much the team. I and the rest of you publicly also. thank the team here too any other questions Thomas thank you no I want to thank you all thank you Well, I don't know how Mr. Mr. Chairman, um, uh, folks, thank you all for coming out. I'd like to ask you a favor. Um, stay. We, yeah, please stay, actually, for <laughs> five more minutes, because I'd like to have, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, have our um, solid waste staff come up and do their presentation on our beach basket program while we have a good audience. So if you all would be kind enough to stay for five minutes. Sue, are you ready? Is that okay, Mr. Do that? Chairman? Yes. So, Sue, come on up. we got a crowd here for you. Do your thing.
usually, and, and thank you for that, Mr. Vice Chairman, because by the time Sue comes up, generally we have about four people left. We need to get the word out. May, uh, may I say one thing on the previous matter? Sure. Before we close it out. I, I just wanted to thank everyone uh, for being here today uh, with regard to the Second Amendment. And I, I hope that you'll be happy to know that in addition to the resolution, each of us is personally sworn when we take the oath of office to uphold the Constitution. And I'll, I'll take a moment. It's only one sentence. This is what we say, each of us, if you're not here for swearing in. I do solemnly swear that I will support, protect, and defend the Constitution and government of the United States and of the state of Florida, and that I am duly qualified to hold office under the Constitution of the state, and that I, that I will well and faithfully perform the duties on which I am now about to enter, so help me God. So each of us, uh, beyond the, the resolution, and I think you know that's a wonderful thing, but each of us has personally uh, sworn to uphold the Constitution. So I just, I wanted to add that too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, that's, uh, in some cases, that's a statement that's made on the very first day, the most joyous day of your political career. And then it's sorely forgotten uh, very quickly. But, uh, and I appreciate that. We do, uh, we do and are committed to you and uh, we do hear you. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes what we all want can't be accomplished, but this time what we all wanted is accomplished. So I wanna thank you. Please, Sue. Thank you for having me. Uh, for the record, Sue Flack, Solid Waste Disposal District. Um, I'm here today on a very positive note. Um, we're here to kind of celebrate the roll off of our uh, beach basket pilot program that we rolled out a, a year ago. <laughs> Waiting on the PowerPoint. There it is. There we go. Um, I'm here today uh, in collaboration with Indian River County Parks and Recreation, who has been insurmountable in helping us roll out this program, and also Coastal Connections, who is our collaborative partner on this program and um, helped along the way with our success. Next slide. So we're just gonna briefly go through some of the um, successes that we've had. Um, the purpose of this project was a convenient way for um, residents and tourists and anyone visiting our parks and beaches to minimize debris that's washed up along our shores um, with the convenience of taking one of these baskets to collect and then disposing of it properly when they're finished, which of course enhances our, our coastal um, beaches and also helps us with sea turtle nesting habitat. But also part of this um, program was to create a collaborative project across county departments but also with a wonderful uh, community group, Coastal Connections, that had a like-minded vision for this project, which was to see it um, come, become successful and go long-term. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kendra Cope from Coastal Connections. Does this work? Perfect. Thank you, Sue, for the introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here to talk about this uh, past year's uh, project with the Beach Basket program. Um, so to dive into a little bit more information of what this last year has um, held for us, the initial uh, pilot for this project was to actually start with only three stations for these beach baskets across the county. So you can see here in these pictures that these beach baskets are just the same size as a local shopping basket you would find at a grocery store, um, but they're convenient enough, they're placed at the actual beach access next to a trash can, um, and they encourage beachgoers to go and do a self-guided cleanup. So the install, uh, which is, you know, the ribbon cutting for that install was at that front, that top picture, but the install was in February of 2020. And uh, the Beach Basket coordinator, Sherry Davis, who couldn't be here today, along with Sue Flack, chose three specific county beaches to start this project at. Those were Wabasso Beach Park, Tracking Station Beach Park, and Round Island Beach Park, all conveniently spaced throughout the county to encourage people all over the areas who visit our beaches to partake in this program. Um, and then our role with the organization here 
was to track and monitor these baskets over time, make sure that they stayed clean and that we sanitized them for public use, and then also to then report on the use and then tracking of those baskets over time. Hey, Kendra, I just have to ask, I see Commissioner Adams in the picture and just, Commissioner, did you walk more than your 25 feet with the basket that day or was that your limit again? I actually <laughs> didn't even walk on the beach with the Oh basket. boy, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just so a... I did not walk 25 feet down the beach. What do you get in the still... bill? Uh... <laughs> I'm sorry, Kendra. I just had to had to get that I in. Did, I did walk on the beach that day. Right. So did that you go good. twice to make up for her? Yeah, several times. Wow. Um, no, but we did want to say thank you again for being there to be a part of that inaugural um, installation. Um, but what happened over the next few months was something I think we weren't really expecting, and that was both county staff, Sue Flack and, and maybe some other people in SWID, but also our organization started getting multiple emails from public, in, uh, public members um, of our community and, and visitors, but also social media tags. People were taking pictures of it and tagging us saying, wow, look at this, how cool. Um, and then they started asking us questions. Well, why aren't these in the city beaches? They're just as populated. They're used just as often as our county beaches. Um, and so with a lot of hard work from county staff, then in July of 2020, we installed five more stations as part of this pilot. And so that was really exciting. Those, in, those locations are JC Park, Sexton Plaza, Humiston Park, Flame Vine Beach Access, and the South Beach Park area as well. And our role didn't change at all. We still stayed true to monitoring, sanitizing, and reporting on, these bas on this basket project. And we had a lot of um, community members step up to want to volunteer and be a part of this as well to be on our team. And so, as I think uh, Commissioner Adams, sorry, um, for being par part of that, I also want to thank, thank Commissioner Moss, who are now Commissioner Moss, who was then at that time Vice Mayor of the city, um, for being a part of that ribbon cutting as well as many of the other city staff and other officials. And so it's just a really exciting moment for us. Um, but really what we want to talk about today is, is what's happened over this past year. And the fact is, is those, these baskets are being used. And we know that because we've been recording the use of these baskets over this time. Uh, one of the ways is through personal observations. We have members of our team, a couple of them you can see represented in the audience today, who are out on the beach almost every day. And so when we come across individuals using these baskets, we always like to ask permission if we can take a picture and share it. And luckily, they always say yes. <laughs> Um, and we get social media texts. We know people are using them. And so you can see some of those pictures here on the screen now. Um, but another thing that tells us about use is the data. Data tells stories. And we love taking the data collected through each quarter of the year and, and, and finding out what are the traveling stories of these baskets. And just to give you an example of traveling stories of baskets from just this past May, on May 1st, we had baskets that belonged at Humiston that were found at South Beach Park because each of these baskets is uniquely coded, so we know exactly where it belongs. Um, on May 10th, we had a basket that was uh, supposed to be at JC found at Humiston. They went to go return it, at, and then they found a Humiston basket at JC, and they had to go back and return those. Um, and then lastly, on May 31st, we had a basket that belonged to the Flame Vine Station found at Sexton Plaza. So we do know that these are moving by beachgoers who enter in one location and may exit. But with basket travels also comes basket loss. And this is not something that we were not prepared for. We knew that over time some baskets would disappear, but we didn't know how many, and that was all part of this pilot effort. Um, but we, now after a year, we know a lot more about our baskets and also why these might be disappearing. Some of those reasons include we have a bunch of regular beachgoers, people out on the beach almost every day, and so they might have taken one home because they're going to use them very frequently, and then that way they can always be guaranteed to have a basket. Um, some visitors, well, as you can see here in this picture, uh, visitors to the area, they might be uh, staying at a local accommodation, and they might go onto the beach, see these baskets partway through their walk, and then grab one and take it back with them, and they might forget about them. Um, some visitors do take them and share them with their other local municipality, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But my personal belief, they're just kind of the coolest collector pieces of all time. And so some people just really like them. Can't say that they're wrong. So uh, 
But what does rate of loss really look like? Um, you can see the quarters broken down here over the past year um, where we're starting to see a range of basket loss between seven to 10 baskets um, throughout each of the quarters, which is approximately about 25%. But when we look at the cost of this material, it breaks down to only $8.98 per basket. So that's telling us that even if we were to replenish those over time in one year, that's a $360 assumed materials maintenance fee, which is rather inexpensive, which is shown to be quite fruitful for us because a lot of people are using this material. And so lastly, just to kind of finish up the presentation, I do want to bring Sue back up because I think this is exciting to share this moment together. Um, and so I was, she wanted to really touch on what's happening since we've installed these and a lot of positive influences are happening and that starts with media coverage. Yes, so <clears throat> we've been everywhere with media coverage. Any uh, printed material, we've been on the radio, we've been interviewed, we've been on TV. Um, we've really had some, some great press and, and gone far with media coverage. And Kendra has taken it one step further, and I'll let you talk about that. Yeah, so aside from maybe some paid promotions to get people interested in it, we have had a lot of organic media coverage coming from interested individuals who've taken this back home, including Channel 12, which we were um, excited and ecstatic to really talk about this um, collaborative opportunity. Uh, but We've also been approached by multiple municipalities and other community groups outside of our county who want to take this program further and apply it to their local beaches as well. And they've been asking a lot of questions. I always see Sue, Sue every time we get an, uh, an interest um, because it's just exciting to see other people ecstatic about this opportunity. Um, and so those include, you know, individuals or community groups from Broward County um, currently working in the process with Okaloosa County and even Lee County just reached out recently and they also want to uh, look into installing a resource like this. So very good things happening from, from this project. Um, and so that really just leads us into our next steps. So next steps, we are going to install the remaining, remaining beaches with baskets. Those would be the ones that you see there listed. And we are also in the process of replacing the baskets with the metal handles, with plastic handles for durability. And last, we are positive that this will become a permanent public resource at all of our beaches across the 22.4 miles of the county coastline. So it's a good thing. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. We did have a captive audience and uh yeah thank you all for sticking around yeah appreciate we appreciate it. it thank you keep our beaches clean so you're all, you're all dismissed now <laughs> okay I, you want to take a, a brief break let them all get out of here and we can just sit here for a minute or two yeah 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 i'm gonna do it Do that. We'll, when we all get together, if you want to do that, you have to the right place.
All right. I, I, I think of it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This guy's a worker. He's a worker. When we all come back, if you want to do a yeah. Oh come on. Okay. Okay. Be blessed. Vice Chairman. Thank you. What are we doing? He want he wants to. Oh, so where's your? Okay. Paul and I talked about it plenty, so I kind of knew where we were, so we ended up in a good spot. Uh yeah. Um, we're gonna take a brief recess for the picture. Go ahead. We're back in session, and uh, well, we'll move forward with the agenda. Um, I don't see Humanshu here, but Mr. Chairman, do we want to move up the leachate treatment agreement with Indian River Sustainability Center since those gentlemen have been sitting here very patiently for most of this morning? Or it, is, awesome. is Humanshu across the way? Yes, yes. He could be here in post haste, most certainly. Um, well, if we're going to jump to the solid waste while we're waiting for Humanshu, um, Mr. Chairman, I'll go ahead and move approval of staff recommendation for item 15B2, which is a work order with Geosyntec for an air operations permit Second. renewal. Oh, that's a motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Adams. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. And I do see Hamanchu here. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, Hamanchu with the Solid Waste Disposal District. Uh, apologize. Um, so staff has, uh, with board approval, uh, negotiated the leachate agreement with the uh, Indian River Eco District, uh, Heartland, and Proximo, and we're, we're happy to report that uh, all the sides, it took a little bit of time going back and forth, but we have a successful uh, leachate agreement that we recommend for board approval. If you have any specific questions, I'd be happy to go over any details. Mr. Chair, I, I checked with Jason, and Jason is good with the um, contract. Just Dylan, um, from your point of view, are you, are you good with it as well? 
Yes, thank you. I, Hamanchu, Jason, uh, the utility staff, and then also um, Heartland and Alon, we've all worked very hard to get it, and I think we've gotten to a good spot. Okay, and this, this contract also delineates the use of the landfill gas will be initially with the leachate system till we build up enough volume, and then I'll start going to the Indian River sustainability. Is that still the plan? That's correct. So initially, before the um, RNG facility is built, we're going to utilize all the gas for the leachate project. Right. When the RNG facility is up and running, then we'll divert the gas, and, and then we'll be using uh, you know pipeline gas right. uh, mm -hmm. at that time. Uh, but the goal would be is that at some point, we might be able to use landfill gas for both projects. Right. That's okay. Very good. Ultimate goal. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, if there's no other questions, I'll be glad to go ahead and approve the uh, leachate agreement. Second. And uh, do we have any uh, further discussion from the operators? If not, do we have anything on the Internet? Anybody from the public? Any further discussion once again here? Mm -hmm. On motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by myself. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you all for waiting patiently. Appreciate yes. it. And thank, thank you for moving that up. They, they want to get back to work, too. Uh, next item is uh, community development, which is a review of proposed request for proposals for a developer to redevelop the former Gifford Gardens apartment site with housing that is affordable. Good morning, Commissioners. Phil Matson, Community Development Director. And uh, this is a very exciting project because it represents a, what was a, a, a uh, code enforcement and, and even a law enforcement issue for the county uh, for, for many years that we're in the process of turning into something really beautiful for the community and a great uh, method of addressing our housing affordability crisis, which, which we know is very prevalent here in the county. So uh, with that, I'm going to introduce Bill Shute. He's the uh, Long Range Section Chief. Uh, Bill's the guy with all the answers, and Bill has a presentation on our proposed RFP for the redevelopment of the Gifford Garden site. So, Bill, are you ready? I think I am. Th thank you, Phil. <clears throat> so, once again, Bill Shute, Chief of Long Range Planning, Indian River County. And we just have the address of this particular site shown on this slide. is 4730 40th Avenue. And back in December of 2018, the Board of County Commissioners uh, requested that its Affordable Housing Advisory Committee discuss, study, and review the affordable housing issue within the county and develop, a n develop new recommendations to encourage development of affordable housing. And out of the, there was many, many meetings that occurred with the AHAC, and out of that, there were a total of 15 recommendations that were ultimately presented to the Board of County Commissioners on February 18th of 2020. Um, Twelve of them were ultimately approved, with uh, the other few being uh, kicked back to the AHAC for some legal considerations. Um, but one of those was for the approval and uh, really to redevelop the former Gifford Garden site. And the Gifford Garden site was a 55-unit multifamily site. As, as Phil mentioned, it was really in, in disrepair and neglect for years and subject to numerous code violations and, and so forth and ultimately was uh, demolished and uh, you know the, the board's action really most recently this, this past year um, was to acquire the property uh, and you know there was many liens on it so it was a very minimal cost to acquire the property and you know we've been gradually moving forward with uh, different strategies to really um, propose a redevelopment of the site now, the Gifford community uh, leaders, we had meetings with the Gifford community leaders and as well as AHAC members and discussed, well, what might the site redevelopment look like in, in the community? What, you know, what uh, features, what, what would the community envision seeing for the site? So a lot of those recommendations that, and the structure of the overall RFP um, it came from Gifford community leaders and AHAC members. Now, the, the overall RFP, it's, you know, it's a fairly new thing for the county to take on an RFP and redevelop a site and, and invite a developer to, to do uh, housing on, on a site. So uh, there was a lot of involvement with different county departments as well as AHAC, and uh, you know, the purchasing division had to look at it, risk management, county attorney had to look at it, and uh, really look at it and, and look for 
you know, various issues that, that should be discussed and addressed in it. Um, so, you know, after the board action back in February 2020, in the AHAC review and development of the initial draft, there were still some outstanding financial issues to be addressed. One was the county utilities department. There were 55 multifamily ERUs, equivalent residential units, and there were liens on the property. And the, the BCC ultimately voted to remove utility liens and to preserve 22 single family ERUs and remove charges associated with the 55 multifamily ERUs. So the 22 single family ERUs, that's really, uh, you know, staff had worked with the AHAC and developing a very basic sketch drawing of the site, what it might look like if it were developed with single family homes and came up with approximately 22 single family units. So that's kind of why the board um, focused on that number. Um, the BCC action, really, so the BCC's action was taken to make the property marketable to a prospective developer. Uh, you know, getting rid of these substantial liens and, and preserving the ERUs is just, uh, you know, they were really an impediment to the development of the site. So the RFP was shared with various county staff departments. Additions and changes were made um, once some of those things were incorporated into it. And, you know, that's around the time that COVID-19 was really, um, and a lot of the development programs were really underway and taking off here at the county too. So uh, the county was involved with the CARES Act funds and, and looking at mortgage and rent assistance program, rolling all that out and helping, uh, you know, the community address the immediate crisis that, that was underway. Uh, more recently, the ARP fund, American Rescue Plan funds, were considered by the Board of County Commissioners, uh, another round of funding from the federal government. And the BCC approved multiple housing programs. And one of those included a, a financial incentive for developing this particular site, $350,000 for design and infrastructure expenses. Um, so, you know, the, the plus is, you know, dealing with federal programs, some things can be fairly slow, but, we, you know, we really worked hard to put all that out, all the staff and the administrator and so forth. So, but uh, came up with that, that $350,000 incentive as an addition to this RFP. So the RFP is an overview of the desired outcome for the project. It includes general site information, site design requirements, development incentives. Um, it, it requires a developer's agreement be executed to really solidify the different requirements in the RFP. Uh, it includes a process for selecting a developer, which would involve a selection committee with review criteria, with the committee being appointed by the county administrator. Uh, it provides a format for providing a response to the RFP. So you get a standard response to include different things and in contact information, budget, um, proposed sale prices of the homes, which should be important because um, the RFP really uh, attempts to target uh, the category between 80% and 120% of AMI. I'm actually getting a little ahead of myself. I have a, a table I'll show you in a minute on what that means for the, the dollar amounts. But um, the overall RFP also looks at the issue of, you know, what's the end product going to look like? Uh, the, the goal is to have an aesthetically pleasing owner-occupied concrete block single-family home. So some durable uh, construction materials built for, for the homes um, with three bedrooms and two bathrooms on small lots. Um, so the small lots reference in particular, let me just back up and say that the overall acreage of the site is 3.33 acres. So when you start to lay it out and put streets on, you, you end up with smaller lot, um, uh, more of a smaller lot subdivision. Um, so in order to accommodate more home ownership opportunities on site, uh, and again, it's a small lot, small acreage, 3.33 acres, common areas, community facilities will be kept to a minimum. Um, many, and, and that's also recognizing the fact that there's many recreational opportunities in the Gifford community. You have the Gifford Youth Achievement Center, North County Pool, uh, all in close proximity. Uh, design of homes will incorporate architectural diversity to maintain visual interest. Uh, it will include safety features such as impact windows, um, which also has the benefit of, you know, particularly if you get elderly household members in there, you don't have to put up storm shutters. And, and to add to that too, the, the statement there will, they will be universally designed to accommodate all ages. So that once again, um, takes into consideration that you can have older household members in, in a house and you might need uh, wider doorways for wheelchair access or uh, grab bars and things like that nature. Uh, a homeowner association is anticipated, but with minimal fees to be established to really just to focus on community maintenance and upkeep. 
So going back to the incentives, uh, as mentioned a little while ago, the, the board's been active and you know clearing up issues with the property. So you have 20, 22 single family impact fee credits. Um, Oh, sorry about that. I should have transitioned to 22 single-family water and sewer ERUs, as I discussed before, because the board approved those. were associated with the prior, prior project, and then you have 22 single-family impact fee credits. So since there were 55 multifamily units on the property, um, whenever you have previous uses on a property, you have impact fee credits associated with those uses. And in this case, you know, not all the 55 multifamily units would be necessary, but you know, there's plenty of uh, impact fee credits from those 55 to, to handle the 22 single family impact fee credits for the single family uses. Um, again, $350,000 financial incentive for design and infra infrastructure expenses, which is new. And staff is available to expedite the project and provide technical guidance to developer, engineers, contractors, et cetera. Purchases of homes, so I mentioned earlier, target range is between 80 and 120% of area median income. And that target range really goes back to a lot of the study that the AHAC had, had done um, back in 2019, 2020 time frame. And understanding that that income group is really one that uh, is not being addressed um, for affordable housing. Well, let me take that back. Don't say affordable housing. <laughs> housing that is affordable for, for, and it could include workforce housing. It could include, um, you know, just various um, professions, you know, police, teachers, um, fire, um, and so, so forth. Um, so let's see. The homes will have affordability restrictions for 10 years, so the RFP specifies that. Homes will have price points that the target household income range can afford with financing from a bank at a competitive fixed interest rate. So here's a chart that shows some of the income ranges. Uh, the center column that's the lighter gray is the 80% area median income, so that's the cap for that. So it'd be between, if it was a one-person household, it'd be between $40,900 and $61,320 that the income uh, the household could earn to participate in this program. Four-person household, that's between 58,400 and 87,600. And these incomes, they, they change annually. So it, it would anticipate that it would change again, usually around April timeframe. Um, it's released by the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the, and the state, Florida Housing Finance Corporation. So developer qualifications anticipated in RFP, a minimum of 10 years of development experience, provide examples of completed projects, have the ability to obtain financing, and the ability to provide a construction bond. When it comes to evaluating the proposals that are submitted, um, you know, with RFPs, there's typically, excuse me, typically points that are assigned and, and criteria developed. So in this case, uh, the criteria involves looking at the development team experience and past performance, 15 points. We look at the financial feasibility, of the actual project, um, so we'd have to analyze it once they submit the proposal. They can get up to 15 points. Look at the quality of the proposal, uh, requested information and attention to detail, quality of design and construction. So that goes back to, you know, a lot of the overall site design, but also the the types of houses that are proposed and the architectural design. Uh, disposition strategy. You know, how how are they going to get these out to the potential buyers and market the property? Ability to proceed. Uh, you know, do, are they capable of coming in with a site plan and going through the process of getting the approvals of Planning Zoning Commission, Board of County Commissioners for the overall project? Uh, the community compatibility, 20 points. Um, you know, is it sensitive to the needs of the Gifford community? And uh, is it compatible with the goals and objectives of the Gifford Neighborhood Plan? So a tentative timeline is proposed in the RFP which would be to obtain the board's approval today and to advertise. Uh, and then to advertise the RFP beginning on July 26, 2021, with the RFP submission deadline of August 31st, 2021, with committee review of the RFP responses sometime in September, and BCC review of committee recommendations and contract execution with developer uh, October, November of 2021. Uh, with that, staff, and the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee recommends that the Board of County Commissioners review the proposed final draft RFP, uh, provide any proposed changes to the RFP, 
allow any potential edits to the RFP as may be recommended by the various county review departments, and direct staff to advertise the RFP as may be modified. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. I just want to add a couple of things to his presentation. Um, Bill and I put a lot of work into this. We reviewed a lot of the RFPs from comparable counties and other counties, and even some places out of state. Um, we modeled a lot of this on the Paramore community in Orlando, for instance. We tried to look at successful examples of county-private partnerships that were good at delivering, you know, the objective, which is affordable, low-cost housing and that meets the community needs. And kind of what I learned through this process is there's an art to it. You, you don't want to over-prescribe. You don't really want to dictate from the government level what everything should be and look like, but you do need to put the basic minimal protections in there. And that way a private developer could come in and, and bring its own creativity and tried and true techniques to the project. So I think we hit that balance, but we're certainly amenable to, you know, any comments from the board or anything you'd like to do or directions you'd like to take it. And uh, fundamentally, you know, with the interests of the community are in mind and the, pro the right product for the right, right location. So thank you. <coughs> Phil, do you think an RFP on this for August 31st is enough time? Being it's it's a bit ambitious. Um, we we are working with purchasing. We've run it by the county departments and legal. I think we could probably meet Bill's timeline. I mean, if we needed to amend it, we could. Yeah, I, I was just wondering. Cause, I mean, you know, with everything and be already be in the middle of July. Yeah. Yeah, we, we can we can adjust it. That is, uh, like like Phil's mentioned, you're pointing out a, a quick timeline, and it all, all depends on you know, with the developers and their capacity to really produce. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great idea. I think it's you all to be commended for this and, 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 and be proud of what you've done. And uh, I think it's great. I've, that was the only question really that I have is, is your timeline. Yeah, let's add, let's add at least a week, two weeks to create a little buzz and get, you know, it to circulate a bit. That's fine. I, I can cover on that on the uh, maybe a little ambitious. Uh, Bill, you begin the pre presentation with uh, actually not missing the old site, and uh, yeah, I was one of those uniforms that had to be a, a frequent attendee. Uh, yeah, it's we needed to be a positive movement, and we needed to be right for the community, and uh, in, in doing so, I'm I'm just thinking that. Uh, might be a little close. Okay. Uh, I don't. I don't want anybody to short side anything uh, that's going to be committed to the to the citizens, to the the people who will be occupying the buildings, uh, to uh, the county. We're we're committed to make it right. It was definitely wrong in the past, and uh, we might need a little extra time on that. Uh, We'd probably give it a month for the developers to put their proposals together that might be yeah, maybe more September time or sometime then yeah again September. not trying to delay it but uh, no we we want to get it right i mean you don't you only get one crack at this so i don't want somebody to take something off the third shelf and say this will fit I, I i you know this is built. No, good point we, we were anxious to get it on the street and this is i think the time would help thank you mm -hmm. mr chairman um phil you'd mentioned you'd looked at other projects similar to this from other counties could you expand on that a little bit like yeah they I took get one, one was from Colorado one was or? from out west with Paramore community the difference on the Paramore proposal the land was a little bit spread out it wasn't one three acre site located in one location it was uh, different lots uh, spread throughout the neighborhood but they bid it all as one and said come in and infill these sites they were probably houses that were condemned and torn down and they said put something better up where this was and make it marketable and make it sellable. So uh, that was probably the closest, both physically and, and um, I guess administratively, to what we wanted to do. It was land that the county somehow ended up with that they went and gave out back to the private sector. So uh, that's kind of what we're looking at, getting people into these sites, and we did look at a few examples. Okay. Cause my, we didn't know where to start. You know, we, we, we're, we're fairly new at this. Right, yeah, absolutely. Because um, one of my concerns is just given the current construction market right now, it may be difficult to get somebody to bid on this. Um, just a caveat, I'm not sure how many responses we're going to get, but that might be a little difficult right now. Um, 
And I'll have to say our staff decision and the county administrator's decision to put some of the uh, art money in doesn't hurt. I mean, that's 350000 in infrastructure that gives this a leg up. Right. So the things are falling into place on that end. But, yeah, we're concerned about that, too. I'm dying to see the proposals that come in. Right. And then, Bill, you had a bullet point on the Homeowner Association. And then the backup here, it says at minimal to no cost, with the main purpose being to have an annual meeting and share information. I think it has to be clear that there will be a cost because you're going to have a stormwater pond that needs to be maintained here. Um, there'll probably be some type of entryway landscaping that will need to be irrigated and mowed. So I just want to make sure um, that it's clear that there will be HOA fees to maintain these common areas and that there will be a cost. But it, it could certainly be a low cost because you don't have a, a pool or a clubhouse and, you know, high cost things like that. But there's got to be some maintenance of the stormwater pond and common areas. And then, Bill, can you define what the affordability restrictions are? Affordability restrictions. So the 10-year the time frame? Right. And how it's implemented or just? The yeah, what, so, so what does that mean? I mean. Okay. All right. So, I, you know, initially when the, the vision was that, you know, we're going to target the income groups. So. You know, in our department, we work with the SHIP program. SHIP program, we get some financial information on applicants, and we verify that they're in certain income target ranges that the state requires. So, you know, we're envisioning doing something similar here or having a developer maybe doing that on the county's behalf and uh, then certifying, certifying the, the, the work that um, they are, in fact, in an income range. And the 10-year time frame, there was discussion at the AHEC about the 10-year time frame. And, you know, I think there's some that were thinking, well, maybe not have it, and then others, well, maybe more, and uh, Commissioner Moss may be able to jump in, too, on my memory of it, too, but, um, you know, I, I think if you're going to have a changeover in ownership, then you're going to have to, if you have the affordability provision, you're going to have to have some kind of mechanism, whether it be like a deed restriction, that would trigger a review during that 10-year time, time frame again. Um, but so, let me tell you where I'm coming from, and maybe that'll help you. So... I look at this as, as two different ways, okay, are we, are we looking to provide housing to give somebody just a landing spot um, and then that's it, or are we not only trying to do that but also give them a path forward to a, a better lifestyle, a better quality of life, and as an example, my wife and I, our first house was a very small house on a dirt road, we put a lot of sweat equity into it sold it with the, the market appreciation, so now we had a little equity to work with, bought a little bit bigger house, put more sweat equity in, and so you continue to kind of move up your, your, your quality of life and, and but by doing those things and being able to capture that increase in the, the value of your home. And so let's just say somebody, these houses sell for 125000 let's just say, as a number. So somebody buys that and they um, live there for seven years, and then they get an opportunity, they got to move, you know, whatnot, they, ha they have to sell. And so we can say, well, okay, you know, you can only sell that house for 130000 so you're, you're not even making any money. And then, our, then do you say, well, yeah, we, we, you know, we gave them an opportunity, but we put our boot on their throat by not letting them get out of that hole. You see what I'm saying? But at the same time, I don't think we want to set a price that somebody come in, buy it, and then flip it, you know, uh, you know, as a profit thing. So my only, kind of where I'm getting at is I think there should be some mechanism that when people get in there that they, that they can improve their status in life with some equity gain, but not, you know, where a flipper is going to come in and just flip it. So it just has an idea to think about. So maybe for every year that you live in the house, you can get 3% of that market appreciation. So my seven-year example, somebody would be able to get 21% above their, their purchase price, um, which would go into their pocket and make them financially more secure, but wouldn't be so high as to make it unaffordable, you know, seven years from now for the next person coming. I don't know, just, just something like that. You know, I'm, I'm just trying to, think and where, where I would like to see us do is not only we're going to give you affordable housing today but through home ownership you're going to be able to better your financial status 
seven, five, seven, ten years from now. That that's kind of just where I'm I'm coming from. I, I like that. I like that. I, it might be an incentive for you know better proper care, better care of the. And yeah, that that's yeah. If they know they they're going to get value out of it, they're more likely to take better care of it. That that's an excellent point. So, we were talking some about, you know, some issues here uh, on how to approach. I mean, there's things that need to be worked out really with the developer. I think mm -hmm. maybe this is one where they can submit a proposal as part. Um, but, you know, other ideas, I, I know we have a, a local nonprofit that does the equity interest or, or the ownership and the appreciation. I'm sorry, there's appreciation agreement where they'll give so much appreciation value back to the homeowner if they sell within certain set time frames. Um, you know, I, if you do maybe the deed restriction concept, um, you might be able to sell it, you know, whatever the market's going to bear uh, under that co concept, as long as they can get the financing and they're within the 80 to 120% income, area median income range. Um, but yeah, I definitely see merit in your, your point too that maybe it needs to be outlined and spelled out and say that. Um, yeah, because you know if we're maybe just it looking the the sale price in some ways too. I, I guess cause it's going to buy the fact that that's between eighty hundred twenty percent area mean income. Um, yeah, a, a couple of ways we can do this. I have a few thoughts on this. So to begin with. Nobody's stuck in the house. I mean, it's not like it's in 10 years, you, you know, have to pay everything back that went into it. You could sell it in seven years. What can you sell it for? You could sell it for a price that would be up to 120% of median income affordability. Does that meet your 3% per year? It might be higher. It might be lower. So let's think about the contingency if it's lower. So the seven-year person sells his house in seven years, wants to reap the equity. We're all for that. Maybe what we can do if we have to amend this bill, and we'll give this some thought, uh, should we change our 10-year duration time limit to 10 years with consideration of equity stake in homeowner? Mm -hmm. And then I think a lot of this is going to be handled by the proposal itself and what they submit and mm -hmm. what they envision. And, so, and, and, I th and I think that's where we are. I think maybe we make the language a little more generic, like we talk about a 10-year affordability time period but we allow the, the proposers to propose the, the nuts and bolts of how that, of, of how that would work, whether it's this appreciation right. um, you know, index or whatever, and, and we could finalize that with, with the selected developer and give some, some leeway because they may have better ideas than, than, than we have today at Hayda to limit it to one thing that has to be today, but we just say that there needs to be an affordability provision for a 10-year period or something like that. And then we could work with like what Commissioner O'Brien's talked about and what, what Bill's talked about could could the, the details of that could be worked out by the proposal and then the eventual because it does contemplate that we would have a developer's agreement with the with the winning developer there right. and we could we could hash out the final details of that when, once we make a selection. Right. And and, and that's good. Um, I'll leave it to y'all to figure out, but just that's at least that's where I'm coming from. I don't want it to be like they're just renting that house, like making a mortgage payment for seven years, and then, then there's no appreciation. Sure. That they're, cause I'd like for these people to get in there and, and make their financial situation better through home ownership. And so however we can achieve that and still be affordable, I'll leave that to you guys with the developer agreement. But that would be my intent to allow them to capture some of that value and improve their financial situation going forward. Okay. And, and maybe as far as RFP goes, maybe to be um, under the proposal content and construction, we could tighten up some of that language maybe. In, in, uh, we'll I'm just up. looking for a place, just, just if we, we're okay doing that. Yeah, I'm thinking great. just the bullet on page two here, but I mean, yeah. I mean sorry. Okay. So page, there might be even in Well, if, if the board is okay with that, then just ask you guys to work that in somehow. Okay. We'll do it. All right. Perfect. Yeah, I think, yes. Uh, may I say one thing? Um, I think that's very reasonable. I've been speaking to community land trusts, and they do have a way of doing that, of allowing the uh, purchaser to um, uh, benefit from any increase in value b uh, when the person goes to sell. I will um, ask them for some of their specific language and pass it along to you in case it's useful in this, but I, I certainly agree with the concept. And in addition to that, uh, um, Pelican Island Audubon is willing to donate uh, 
uh, native plants, if that's appropriate. Oh, perfect. So it's just, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that he put it in writing yet, but I'll, I'll ask him to send it to you. you know, so if that's appropriate, you have that to work with too. Yeah, things like that keep the cost down for the developer because they still have to meet our site planning requirements. We're a quality county drainage. We don't want these things to back, you know, have flooding, whatever. Landscaping, we want it to be beautiful. So absolutely, anything that can defer a developer cost, we can pass along to the purchaser. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Please. Question for Phil and, and Bill on this is, when I look at the evaluation criteria, if, uh, if we're going to incorporate this concept of giving the developer the opportunity to develop a plan of how to address this sort of income issue and sellability and the like, where do you think that incorporates in as part of the, the criteria? Oh, uh, absolutely. I think that comes in with uh, where we meeting the needs of the community community compatibility. So here we have, we're sort of emphasizing the physical sensitivity of it, but you gotta figure one need of the community is to better, you know, betterment of a, of, a, of an upwardly mobile population. So we could probably change a little bit of the language in here. So we could say community interest and compatibility. So that's what I had thought originally that kind of popped into my head when, when we started bringing this up. Great, I just wanted to make sure we had a place to land that because when I read this, this was more site building appearance based versus well some of it is that and some of it is can they do the work are they well funded ability to experience doing other sites so yeah so some of it is very technical some of it is very um, site oriented i think computer community compatibility that's a full 20 percent of the criteria i'd say something like uh, community interest and compatibility great i just wanted to make sure the board heard where that may end up and if that adjusted any of the sensitive to the unique needs of gifford i mean obviously acquiring equity is a unique need of gifford so I think it'll fit good. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that we approve the RFP with um, one change to move the response deadline back to maybe mid-September and then to incorporate the equity provision as we've discussed. Second. One motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Airman. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you all. Thanks. Next item is uh, from General Services, the irrigation system uh, pump station replacement of Sand Ridge Golf Course. Move staff recommendation. That's a motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Adams. Any further discussion? Yes, thank you so much, Michael. Uh, anybody from the audience? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Next item is County Commission of Districts redistricting based on the 2020 decennial census. Thank you very much. Uh, per the Florida Constitution, after each decennial census, the board is to divide the county into districts as nearly equal in population as practicable per Florida statutes that is supposed to occur in odd years. Although I do not anticipate getting census information until September, uh, I thought it was best to at least begin the process of redistricting and starting the conversation. So thus today, I just simply present a schedule to the board to consider. Um, at the August 17th meeting, the county attorney's office uh, would like to present a plan for redistricting, outlining the various criteria which would be used by staff in creating maps. Um, these, in the past, this has been generally uh, basic legal principles, such as um, you know, making sure you don't break, uh, break up certain types of communities, using water bodies as natural barriers, uh, major roadways, not you know, moving commissioners out of their districts. And then we'll present that plan in August. And then once the board approves a plan, uh, we will then from August, mid-August through October, work to develop maps consistent with that plan as approved by the board and also incorporate hopefully the information we get from the federal government. Then from October and November, we'd work on having workshops and hearings discussing different types of conceptual plans that meet the plan requirements. Our, and then finally, ultimately bring a final map to the board for approval uh, at the first meeting in December. Uh, please understand this schedule may change uh, subject to when we actually receive the data. Uh, just the county attorney's office recommends the board provide any input on the schedule and let me know if there's any other issues you'd like to talk about as we start this process. I can say that I've reached out 
uh, and I've scheduled a meeting with uh, Dan Russell, our IT director, who's over GIS, and Leslie Swan to meet, I think, in the next week to start talking about kicking off from here. Uh, I've reached out to the school board to get their imp- information as to whether they just simply want to piggyback off what we're, the, the board's doing. With regards to the map, I've sent a copy of my draft memo to all of the cities so that they're aware of us moving forward on this issue. So I've tried to just you know reach out to all our other agency partners as best I can as we start this. It's a very condensed time frame. Um, we la- I think 10 years ago we got the information in May, uh, but we're trying to do our best to make sure that we get this done by the end of the year. And with that, I turn it back over to the chair. Mr. Chair, Mr. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Adams. Dylan, I was checking with Ed um, regarding the census information, and the last word we got was that the preliminary census information probably won't be released till October, and then the final, you know, won't be till after the new year, which I, I know feeds into <laughs> why your time frame is in flux, but I just throw that out there that for the rest of the commissioners that we're probably going to have to tweak. I think this is a great start for sure, and it's good to have a start and a time frame that we can work on, but we we probably are going to have to adjust it. Yeah, and, and as I said in the memo and, and noted in, in my presentation, this may change based upon that. I'm just trying to do my best so that we can get this done by the end of the year if it's possible to do so. Yeah. It may not be, and I, we've just got to then deal with that issue at that time, but I was hoping to at least set us up to do so. You know, rather than later, we should start tackling it, so I appreciate it. I just want you to be aware. Thank you for that. Dylan, just so I'm clear, I can't cherry pick a couple of my high maintenance subdivisions and move them into Commissioner Ehrman's district? Well, I'm going to be bringing a plan back in August for the board to consider. So that may be some of the policies of the board is to try to cherry pick your difficult yeah, districts yeah, and okay. provide them to Ehrman. But that's not typically what we do. You probably could move them into Commissioner <laughs> Ehrman's, but you probably couldn't hopscotch and like move them into Commissioner Flesher's. Maybe. Yeah, but he's right next he's door. Right so next I can just door, so fair game. Yeah, yeah slap them right in there. The general legal principle is and that then, they're compact and like contiguous. And then Jason, isn't it true that the property appraiser stole our G? GIS guy? Um, yes. And isn't it true that we'll be talking about his budget tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, he may. He, and, he, and I hope he's listening right now. <laughs> I hope he's listening. <laughs> the, the revised budget. The budget. Oh, he's going to revise it. Yeah, he, he, <laughs> he, he's going to owe us. <laughs> No, and I've had a long discussion with, with Dylan and Jason about the, the deadline that Commissioner Adams brought up and how do we resolve going into an even year when the statute says odd year and, and all that. But I guess we'll just deal with that when we get there and maybe just go ahead and, you know, it's better to beg forgiveness and ask permission kind of thing. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, now, and my goal was just simply to get it started so that if we could beat not get into that quagmire of what it means to do it in an even year when you don't get the data in time. I was hoping to avoid that, but it may just possibly come forward and we have to deal with it. And, you know, uh, we had a presentation at the Ford Association of County Attorneys uh, Conference last week. Um, while many of you were attending FAC, uh, I can tell you we were, the, the, the recommended preferred method was to bring something back to the board in December based upon the information that we have now. Again, uh, I'm sure me and the other county attorneys will struggle with with this issue to the extent we don't get data until much later than anticipated. Well, I can give you those subdivisions for Commissioner Ehrman like tomorrow, so. (laughs) (laughs) Mr. Chairman, I'll go ahead and move that we approve Dylan's uh, draft agenda here, even though it may change. Second. Uh, Upon motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by myself. Any further discussion? Nothing. Nothing. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much to the board to help me get this kick started. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next item is uh, commissioner items, and we do have a commissioner item, a proposal to move water west by Commissioner Airman. All right, now for the most exciting presentation of the day, and everybody left. That's why it's the last. That's right, that's right. We're going to end this off with, a, with an exciting, just riveting presentation. Okay. Commissioners, if I may, I want to I thank you for, for allowing me to, to, to offer this presentation to you. We all know the importance and the hard work that all of you have put into the lagoon over your years of service, and even Commissioner Moss, when she was the city council, 
with Burbage City Council, you know, worked diligently to try to to try to improve the lagoon as as we all would like to see it. We all know how important it is to our to our wildlife, to our to our citizens for recreation and and, and fishing and things like that, and uh, also to our economy. And so, you know, I, I, if we can do anything to improve it, I, I, I think we we should. We you know we've been tasked for 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 years uh, about removing phosphorus and nitrogen and lowering TDMLs and all sorts of things like that, and and then what to do with stormwater. Uh, we know that stormwater is a major factor, uh, not like it was in, say, in 1914 and the time that R.D. Carter surveyed it and started, you know, building the, the uh, say, the Indian River Farms drainage system like we know it today. But And uh, it's still a marvel in engineering as, as by today's standards. But, sec but second of all, the only thing he didn't plan for was 160,000 people living in the area. So that, that, that was probably something he didn't think about back 100 years ago. But... But, but it works, there, there are systems in place, and, and I feel that I can, I can tell you there is a way to, to reduce the stormwater and the runoff going into the lagoon and put it to good use elsewhere in the county by possibly moving uh, the water to the west using the current in infrastructure that we have and, and adding a few fittings in the piping, as I would like to, as I would like to uh, call it. So let me, let me I, I gave you the background information that you had, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick a few points out of that, that information. Um, I remember before I was elected sitting here in one of the meetings, I, I, I can't recall perfectly, so don't hold me to it, but I think you all were talking about the, uh, but the land acquisition bond that we talked about a few meetings ago, and, I, and, and Commissioner Solari had mentioned that, that uh, you know, he, he would like to see some maybe that land acquisition bond used for different things than buying conservation land. That, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and things of that nature. He said, maybe use it for the lagoon. Maybe, maybe even move move water west. Well, after that meeting, he, he we talked about it for for a few minutes, and and uh, you know, I thought about it and continued to think about it. And and knowing the uh, area of any River County and knowing the, the topography of it and and the way things work, I said, you know, there there might be a way. And so I had to kind of revert back to my my childhood days and, and remembering that that I uh, drove a fuel truck. You know, for at 18 years old, driving a fuel truck, 3,000 gallon gasoline and diesel truck around town, uh, and filling up uh, pumps out on the St. John's Improvement District at the time for the water, and, and it kind of hit me that that there is a there is a, a possible way that we could uh, that we could possibly move some of this water water west if we really think about it, and again maybe put some of the fittings in place. And what I'm going to ask for you all to, to, today is to is to is to is to look at this, and I'm going to show you a few maps and. And look at this and and uh, see what you think and and open it for discussion and and then if we can uh, just you know if we can task the county administrator and staff to to open this discussion up in a formal way to uh, to uh, David Gunner with any River Farms Drainage District and then John Lang is here from St. John's Improvement District open up with him and his group and and other players such as the St. John's River Water Management District that that's what I want to that's what that that would be my goal goal today but We'll, we'll go through this real quick, and I'll give you some of the some of the over, overall added. Even though you did have some of it in your in your handout material, you all know that the lagoon is a fragile estuary system, and it's being affected by increased population and stormwater and things of that nature. And uh, one of the it's one of the main issues we've been we've been dealing with for years. Now we can't remove all the water entering the entering the lagoon, nor should we, because as we all know that the lagoon requires the brackish content to to to, to survive ecologically. It must have that fresh water intake in it to to continue to uh, to continue to thrive. It just doesn't need to have all the nutrients and all the trash and things like that that are in it. But uh, you know, fortunately, I, I feel there the excess water could be put to good use, and that use could be sending it west into the upper St. John's Basin. You'll see on the map in front of you that's kind of the whole area that we're that we're talking about. And the Indian River Farms Drainage District, as you know, is is, is mostly a proper Vero Beach. It runs from 77th Street all the way to the South County Line, over 300 miles of canals and stuff like that. So that'll, and I'll talk about that more in a minute, but that, that's a definite player in the system. But this area that, that's on your map is, is what I'm talking about now. In discussions with uh, Commissioner Bernique with the St. John's River Water Management District over the past few months, 
Uh, he and I have talked at length about this. He, he feels good about this plan. He would like to see it you know, presented formally to the St. John's board and, and see, what, see what their feelings are. But he personally thinks, it's a, thinks it has merit and worth investigating further. But currently the St. John, the upper St. John's Basin, and let me, let me describe this for you real quick for those of you that don't know. The upper St. John's Basin is located basically south of Blue Cypress Lake and north of State Road 60 in that whole area. It's called the Upper St. John's Basin because the St. John's River moves northward. Unusual in them areas, I think there's only a few rivers in the world that move, that move north of St. John's being one of them. So thus, that's called the Upper upper Basin of the St. John's, of the St. John's River being that we're the headwaters of, of that river. That region, because of the use along the St. John's River all the way up to Jacksonville, is being used a lot. There's a lot of big communities up in the area, municipalities that are using this water. And, you know, Jacksonville's even, they're even facing saltwater intrusion up in the Jacksonville area because the head pressure of the St. John's River is not able to keep the, keep the saltwater back like it, like it used to be. But what Commissioner Bernique informed me that the St. John's Basin, right, right here in our own backyard, is, is, is on average two foot or more below the natural water levels that it needs to keep year round. That's even during the rainy season, that they're down, down two feet. It is so critical right now that, it, you know, that, that I know, I don't know if Commissioner Adams heard it uh, when we were at the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Meeting, but the one that, the last one that you didn't attend, uh, Representative Overdorf was there from, who represents northern, uh, or northern Martin County and southern St. Lucie County and Port St. Lucie area, was talking about water and how important it is in our community and, and throughout the state, how we're, the easy water is, is hard to get anymore. But being that this area is low on water and the fact that they don't know what to do with the water from Lake Okeechobee going into the St. Lucie and Caloosahatchee River, they are seriously, seriously considering moving the water from the south up through this basin up to the north and allowing it to move in the St. Johns River. That's, uh, that's a pretty big deal, but, but, but hearing it from him and talking with him a little bit uh, afterwards a little bit was about that they're serious and the legislature is, is, is pending uh, looking, at this, uh, looking at this project as to move some of that water from the, from the South Florida Water Management District up to the St. John's and, uh, River Water Management District. So there, there, there's two established uh, water systems already in place. The first system, and I'm going to read this a little bit because it's a lot of facts to figure. The first system, the primary flood and storm under control for the majority of Indian River County is managed by the Indian River Farmers Water Control District. Covers from 77th Street, like I said, Hobart Road down the South County line and encompasses 300 miles of canals and supporting drainage. The system was designed to move the county's water from the Western Sand Ridge, the I-95 Ridge, corridor, what we call now, east to the Indian River. And uh, water could be taken out of this system it, it, or prevented from entering the system depending on the overall design of, of what the, in, let, let the smart people, as I call them, the, the engineers design as to what the, the system would be, what it would take. The second player in this system is, is the St. John's Improvement District. Located entirely in the western part of the county and covering around 43 square miles, approximately 25,000 acres, and it is you know, it's bounded by State Road 60 to the north and the St. Lucie County line to the south. And uh, its primary mission is to operate and maintain drainage, irrigation, flood water, and surface water control through an elaborate system of canals, pumps, and accessory drainage that, that flows westward. So coupled with the ability to move the excess water into the upper St. John's Basin, and they can do that with their reservoir, and, and we'll go, I'll show you that slide in just a second, uh, going under State Road 60, um, southeast of the Blue Cypress Lake, and eventually up into the headwaters of the St. John's River. Uh, let's go to, Kim, can you give me the next slide? This is an overview of, of the slide area. You'll see where the mouse is. This is the St. John's Improvement District Reservoir, and this is how it goes under 60 and goes into the upper St. John's Basin here. This is the flowway, the, the flowway that they that they have at the St. John's Improvement District. You remember you were just out there when, when Ed and I championed the solar panels. <laughs> You know, y'all were out there with this. You were more right and I had to come and right fix, there. just for the record. You were right there beside it. You were right there beside the flowway on this. This flowway is about five miles in length. It runs from from this location here all the way to there, to all the way to the reservoir. And 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 John is and his guys are, are, are absolutely outstanding and professional in what they do and how they manage the water out there. 
This is the previous solar farm. This is not the one we were at. We were at the one down closer to their headquarters, about halfway down the, the, down the flowway. But what we're looking at here, and we'll go to the next slide in just a second, this is the 4th Street Canal for the Indian River Farms uh, drainage district right here. 4th Street Canal is the fourth largest canal in the, in, the, in the system of the Indian River Farms Water Control District. It's, all, it's also one of the longest because it reaches out all the way to 98th Avenue, I believe, which is, which is this area right in here, considered 98th Avenue. There is a abandoned, there's a canal that runs parallel right alongside the solar farm right here that runs parallel to it. It's an abandoned canal that we used to basically make a berm for the Indian River Farms Drainage District, maybe even part for the initial uh, part of the St. John's Improvement District. This canal is abandoned. It would need to be cleared about a mile and a half long. It does have some monster pine trees on it, but this could be the connection to the Indian River Farms, uh, Indian River Farms Water Control District right here. And it comes down here and it ends in, in sync about, uh, about a half a mile away from the uh, flowway from the St. John's Improvement District. This area right here where you see we're moving does have canals currently in place, so nothing would be done. So, you know, up here to tap into this, to tap into this canal would take either mechanical or, or, uh, or could be gravity fed flow if, if we decide to take it out of there. There is some concern about this canal having enough water in it during the dry season when when you know when when is actually when the upper St. John's Basin really needs the water and then the wet season you know it, it, it's always got too much water which everybody does so that's that's the the enigma if that's the right word or the or the, or the problem with water you either have too little or you have too much so it takes some takes some finessing here so so what do you do in turn Kim can we go to the next slide so what do you do? You have to probably, in this case, have to maybe have, have some, some lakes or some ponds to store your water during the dry season or, and move it out during the dry season to the areas that need it and even possibly uh, and then fill it up during the wet season. So it's going to require some, some reservoirs or ponds or whatever we want to call it to, to feed this system. But here you can see the diagram basically on how the water would move down that abandoned canal into the adjacent canal into the into the flowway of the St. John's Improvement District, out through the reservoir and out into the upper basin. That is basically, that that's basically shows the area of how, how, it, how it would be done. So again, you may have to make some polishing ponds, let's call it, to treat the water, or you may have had some reservoirs to hold the water. It just depends on the overall design on, on what we want to do, but I think it's important that we're able to to, to connect to, uh, to Mr. Gunner's system if need be, and then, and then go from there. And so it, can be, it, so it can be worked out. There has been some comments and some questions about what if we have a tropical event? A tropical event shouldn't have really any impact on this other than if you build a storage pond as to, as to you know, what's it, what's it capabilities and how much it can hold, and then you would do something with it. In the event of a, of, a, of a tropical storm, a hurricane, or something like that, the system would revert back to the way it's been for the last 100 years. Mm -hmm. The Indian River Farms would still take care of their business. The water would have to go east, and, 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 and John and his, his guys would do what they do best about getting rid of the excess water they have within the St. John's Improvement District, too, have their, have their, if there is going to be a tropical event mm -hmm. and that, of that nature. So what's the destination for our stored, our stored water? or excess stormwater, it's gonna be right here in the upper St. John's Basin. This, you know, as you, we all know, the St. John's River Water Management District is the steward of the upper St. John's, upper St. John's Basin. It, it, you know, they handle 18 Florida counties, including any river county. They manage almost 800,000 acres, and they deal with issues of water quality, water supply, et cetera, et cetera. The, the list goes in. And the fact that we are considered the headwaters, I think they're the major player in this because they're going to be the beneficiary of this of this water. Uh, what, what water we can put in here? We can't solve the problem of what's happening in Seminole County, what's happening in Duval County with their water issues, but we can certainly help our county in the upper basin of the St. Johns River Water Management District here by putting some of this water after it's treated properly and it's met all the criteria and all that sort of stuff into the St. John's Basin. We could help it tremendously because they're seeing a lot of, like I said, they're seeing a lot of invasive plants and stuff that wouldn't normally be there had, had the uh, water levels stayed consistent with that. So 
that's where that's where the benefit goes and, and i'm hoping uh to again talking with mr Burnick, that the st john's river water Bank district will be a major player in this and uh, can and can look at it and and uh, see what they think and, and give it their go ahead should they should they uh should they like it after formal talks have entered into with them and uh that's kind of where we're at can we go let's can we go to the next slide real quick Again, this is a more closer view of kind of kind of what's going on with this. This is the area where the lateral D or Four Street Canal ends right here. It would go down next to that and then go out like I showed before. One of the other benefits that, that we kind of found out, figured out later on, I don't know why it didn't hit us from the very beginning, uh, but it was kind of like a couple, about a month or so ago that, well, you know what? We forgot all about the West. I can't ever say it. I'm sorry. <laughs> The West Regional Wastewater Treatment Plant is right there, right there on the 4th Street Canal. The county owns this property over here. It could be a potential reservoir with a park or something, whatever you want, whatever you want to do with it. So that's just another idea. But the fact that this is here and some of this water does get discharged into the 4th Street Canal and runs, of course, to the east. I know there's some issues with, uh, Jason, please correct me if I'm wrong, I know there's some issues with DEP on, on this area and all that sort of stuff. but. You know, I, I think if we can work those problems out, that's a way for some of this for some of this water that actually is pretty good. From what I was told by by Vincent Burke before he left, that this water is in pretty good shape, and it does and it does go into the canal anyways. It, it, why couldn't it move west in the system? Be taken out, be put in a polishing pond, lake reservoir, what you want to call it. Make sure it meets all the criteria before it's put in put in the St. John's Improvement District and, and out into the uh, St. John's st john's uh, upper basin so so that's also a a plus that that i feel that that, that, that could be done because it could be done with that so the fact that uh, you know the sufficient groundwork has been laid and the county staff can enter into discussions with the st john's water management district with with john and his people at the st john's improvement district and with mr gunner team and reforms and any appropriate state and federal agencies and other identifiable and other identifiable stakeholders I think we, we could do this. And the purpose of these conversations would be define the constituent concerns, you know, evaluate the merits, potential return on investment, and engineering and, and feasibility of this concept. And Kim, can we go to the next slide? So some of the advantages I feel are that obviously it's gonna prevent some excess storm water from the Indian River Lagoon with possible water quality benefits to the upper St. John's River Basin. You know, during the heavy rains, I already explained that, there'd be no changes. Uh, potential TMDL reductions for the county, for the St. John's Improvement District, and for the St. John's River Water Management District in that area. The prospect of including water from the West Wastewater Treatment Facility, like I just described, and even opportunities for ag users west of 95, you know. And, 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 and this idea actually came from, from, from Vincent Burke, was that can, can surface water can they use surface water? Can some of these ag users, ag users out west, use some of the surface water instead of the upper Florida aquifer? And also, could they could they receive come in um, through land purchase or purchases or water farming if it's suited for this concept? As, and and that's where the St. John's and River Water Management District would have to come into play if that's if that's in case. And again, I don't see any cost right now to the St. John's Improvement District or the Indian River Farms Water Control District. And the next slide, those things will be worked out in operations such as hydrological details, operational issues to be determined within the study. You know, potential funding via grants and cost shares, I see that as a possibility. And, and given the satisfactory answer to the above, the, the, the plumbing is, is in place. And again, I, I think we just simply need to, need to add the fittings. So again, there's no funding for this project right now. And uh, I think once we, uh, get the staff together to start asking these questions. I mean, there could be funding from different agencies, state agencies, maybe the land conservation bond if it gets passed, things like that in 22, and some other things. But I, I think it holds merit. I think it's worth evaluating with regards to, you know, uh, the system. Again, the, the plumbing is there. It's just a matter of can we, have, can we put the fittings and, and make it work? And, and is, you know, is the, is the risk versus the reward? Is it doable? Is it feasible? Is it cost effective and efficient? Now, those are questions we're going to have to answer, but I think those are questions that that, that, that we could answer. And the fact that uh, to incorporate this with our four other uh, stormwater projects that we have in, in the county, 
I think would, would be huge. And, you know, if it benefits the lagoon and benefits the St. John's River uh, upper basin, I think it's a, I think it's a win-win situation. It's just a matter of, again, to, to, to ask you guys to let's proceed and, and do a study on this and, and see if it is feasible to do. So I'll take any questions or any concerns or. Well, um, Mr. Chairman, if I may, just uh, first, I'd like to commend you for bringing forward a very uh, thorough and impressive uh, agenda item. So thank you for doing um, all your work on this. It's a, a very, very good presentation. Um, I, I love the idea. Um, a couple of concerns that just kind of popped up real quick. Um, there was a, a bill passed this year in the legislature which really restricts any discharges. And so we would have to caref carefully navigate around that um, to make sure, you know, like the, the the water coming out of the uh, West Regional Wastewater Treatment Plant, um, our limits on that are so low. Um, and even though all of this will help improve everything and prevent the water from going to the lagoon, you, you know how the, the DEPs will look at something like this and, and just they, they can't really see the whole forest because of the trees in the way. So I think we need to be careful. You know, if we put some water into one of your polishing ponds, how at what level do we have to treat it to be able to discharge it again you know so i think uh we those need to be worked out but i think we can do that and then secondly just um hopefully in a month or two i, I know st john's now has the preliminary report on their water supply um, out and in a month or two we'll probably be maybe a little bit more clear going forward will we be able to get more aquifer water to for potable water use or will we have to start looking at, at a surface water supply? So I think we just want to keep that in the back of our mind going forward that um, if that's the direction we end up having to go, can we tie it into this somehow or, or something like that? But I think, I think it's a great idea. I, I agree 100% with you. Some of the fresh water needs to continue to flow to the lagoon. Um, it's just best if that's a steady flow of clean water and not these big surges of dirty water after rainfall events, because the lagoon does need that fresh water um, influx coming in to, to stay as a brackish estuary, which gives it its uh, diversity, like you mentioned. Um, but I, I think I think it's a really good idea worth exploring, um, and, and I think um, it's going to be a lot of moving parts, getting a lot of people to cooperate yeah, I, I here. Know that's not going to happen overnight, but, right? Uh, but um, uh, I, I think your 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 um, your concept, your idea, you know, I think everybody should be able to buy in. It makes a lot of sense. And um, so hopefully everybody else will be on board and say, yeah, we, we want to help move this forward. So I, uh, I uh, again, I commend you for a very good presentation. And uh, I like your idea. And I'm just a couple concerns, you know, keeping the back of our head as we look at this further. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yes. Um, Commissioner Amron, thank you so much for bringing this forward. This agenda item actually um, fits very nicely with several conversations that the county's been having mm -hmm. um, that we haven't been able to share because we can only discuss things at public meetings. So I made some notes and have some other things to add to the conversation. It's kind of jarbly because I was scribbling while you were talking. So if you guys would bear with me for a second. Um, I'll try to put this in some kind of order. <laughs> um, so I do agree that, you know, when it's rainy, everybody has water. When it's dry, everybody needs it. I know the Soil and Water Control District has been raising some concerns about our sending water outside our borders. And um, I know you guys have been attending those meetings, and I think that repeatedly comes up that there's concerns that we are the headwaters, but we don't benefit from that water because we, we send it other places. Um, but there's really no real storage options for the county or the drainage district. So that is one of the reasons why the water either goes to tide or goes up north. Um, the water control districts, the drainage districts, comprise hundreds of miles of canals and right of way that could be used as literal marshes for polishing um, 
for polishing stormwater without much effort, uh, just based on the way they're comprised now. And that could help the county address some of our BMAP issues, but it, I agree, takes a lot of partnerships and cooperation um, amongst ourselves and amongst the different jurisdictions. And I think that's kind of where we've had some, some headbutting in the past is there's so many different um, regulatory agencies or governmental districts or special districts that kind of control all this stuff. It's hard to get everybody to the table to really come up with a comprehensive plan of action of how to address our water issues. So I, I agree with you on that one completely. Um, I feel like what we need to do is we need to clean the water and then we need to store it so we can use that water to recharge the aquifer and also to control discharges to the lagoon so we can help address those salinity concerns and we can help address the fact that when there's a lot of water, nobody has anywhere to put it so it all goes away and when it's dry, everybody needs it but we don't have it because we've let it all go when it was rainy and when we were able to. So creating larger scale um, capacity to hold the water and to clean it um, through the natural polishing ponds and, and recreating that natural marsh system is really the key uh, to kind of addressing some of the concerns of the lagoon, but also addressing the concerns we've heard from other areas of our community regarding water supply, future water supply, um, and saltwater intrusion, and, and all that kind of stuff. I will say that um, there have been several discussions with some of our large property owners, um, between myself, staff. We've we've been on several um, site visits with the Corrigans specifically talking about large-scale donations of property for water quality projects, um, whether that be stormwater treatment or wastewater treatment, recharge, future well fields, surficial water supply, or all of the above. I think that these, all these conversations are swirling and happening at the same time, and the possibility of kind of hooking them all up together um, in a more comprehensive plan is very appealing to me and I think that it's very important that our you know to recognize that we have large property owners that understand the importance of water that understand the protect that protecting our water and cleaning our water is really what we need to be focusing on now for the future because water is in short supply and you have a limited amount of it and we need to make sure that we're protecting it so I think that that kind of fits in while that is and that is to the north part of the map that you showed. I know um, you've been talking about kind of the, the south of 60 plumbing. Um, this would be north of 60, but it does abut up to a mitigation bank, it abuts up to the marsh, and it could provide a really good opportunity um, for water recharge um, and to help with some of our stormwater issues. And I know um, Public Works and Jason and Utilities has been out kind of looking at that Right now, we're, we're talking to them about a fire station location, and once we move through that process, um, the conversation will move back to the water um, process. And I do agree that the West Regional um, Wastewater Treatment Plant could be plumbed just to go right into that 200 acres across the street and held. That would help us avoid the discharge issue, and I think, you know, the way that's already set up, you kind of have your natural because it was a grove, you know, your natural uh, berms and whatnot. So that would probably be a very simple way to address some of those discharge issues that we're having with DEP. And then lastly, you know, funding. There's so many different pots of money out there right now for infrastructure projects, for water quality projects, but I would also remind you guys that there is a huge focus on a state level for resiliency. And resiliency is not just sea level rise. Resiliency is also flooding. And we do have a lot of pockets of the county that have to deal with flooding issues even in a small rainstorm. And there are grants available for resiliency plans 
stormwater retention, stormwater treatment are all different projects that fit into that resiliency umbrella and would really allow us to take advantage of some of that grant dollars that are out there. So I would encourage us as we move through this process and conversation to really think about it on a much larger global comprehensive level as to where, you know, maybe it's not just stormwater, maybe it's all these other things that then create a plan that help us address resiliency, allow us to take advantage of those dollars and dollars beyond just um, the American recovery dollars and the infrastructure dollars that are coming down from the federal level, but really some of those state dollars, because um, it's not just South Florida, you know, it's, it's us, it's coastal communities, it's inter internal uh, state communities that have to deal with flooding and flooding is a big issue when it comes to resiliency and just as an anecdote you know um, one of the things that we have in Felsmere is uh, we have a lot of airboats and that is because Felsmere is a basin so during the hurricanes or a, even a big thunderstorm downtown on Broadway would constantly flood to the point where we had a no wake zone sign made for the restaurant just to kind of keep all the trucks and the airboats that would run up and down Broadway from pushing that water into the restaurant and a couple of years ago the city uh, partnered with the Felsmere water control district and they dug out the canal at the end of Broadway and created a stormwater pond or lake um, they're doing some other things with it to make it more of a park amenity but it's really there as an infrastructure project and since they've done that um, downtown doesn't flood anymore i'm gonna have to retire my no wake zone sign and i really kind of liked it it was like the best picture ever when it was raining but um i say that to say that that is a good example of a partnership between the city and the water control district the city was able to get the grants to help the water control district address their drainage and storage and in return um it helped the downtown businesses from preventing that flooding. So if we can think of projects like that, but on a large countywide scale instead of, you know, that small one or two block scale, I think that there will be um, a good path forward. So I don't disagree with um, anything that you've said. I think that uh, the first step would be to maybe have staff reach out to the different partners that we would have to work with and see if they're amenable to that and then you know bring something back and figure out how to move forward but i think that there's a lot of separate conversations that are happening related to water and water quality and we need to connect all those so we can have a better comprehensive plan and then i have one question that mr lang might know the answer to the evans property dispersed water storage project that is just south of the Little St. John's property, or it's west, okay. I wasn't sure if that was in some way going to connect um, or what they were planning to do with that ultimately, because I hadn't heard anything about it recently, but I know it was working on, they were working on it, so thank you for that. That's all I have. Okay. Okay. That was a lot, sorry. Um. I'd like to uh, thank Commissioner Ehrman for his work on this, and I'm, I'm happy to explore uh, any of the options that we have, and I, it's, it's interesting. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Adams, also for, for your work on this. I think, I think every single one of us uh, sitting here is, ha has an interest, a very sincere interest in water quality and quantity, and maybe have been pursuing it from different angles. For me, it's been uh, USGS, and yes, I'm curbing my enthusiasm at the moment, don't worry. But, um, you know, getting that done and, and also getting workshops, you know, some of the things that so the Soil and Water Conservation District are interested in doing, um, so, you know, suit what I would like to pursue personally. But you know what, there's a synergy to it. You know, if each of us takes a different angle of it, you know, and adds different insight to it, I think, you know, there can be a real synergy, I mean, amongst the five of us. And I would hope that, in a way, that would mirror what we need to do outside this body. You know, what we were talking about it, we need to bring together all these different uh, entities, these, you know, these different, these different groups. So, um, you know, I, I, I like to think it's doable. I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy to work on it, you know, and from my perspective, your perspective, look at all the angles. And I hope that, uh, I hope that'll be true outside our group. 
you know, that they'll want to look at it. So, th you know, thank you uh, for your work on this. Appreciate it. Anyone else? Well, unless, unless you have something to say. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to. <laughs> Well, if anybody else has anything they want to they want to address, but well, my recommendation would be that, uh, such as I wrote, uh, that we task the county administrator staff to work with the agencies named above, uh, evaluating the merits, potential return on the investment, and engineering feasibility of this project, uh, with uh, positive feedback on those criteria and potential potential funding sources could then be examined in detail. And so that would be my motion, but let me add that I do agree with what Commissioner Adams said. I mean, this, yeah, th this thing's bigger than all of us. And, and if we don't do our part throughout the whole county and do whatever we can to whatever opportunities arise, then we would be foolish not to do so. But, but, but uh, my motion will be uh, as written, as uh, that we task the county administrators to work, and, uh, work on this and evaluate the merit. I'm happy to second. See, you wanted me to say something. Well, if you want, you always say something. I know, I know. Well, I'm just happy to, that something is moving forward. There's been some great debate. We've had some decisions made, and this will undoubtedly alleviate a lot of concern after it's navigated and supported as well outside of this group. Do you think there's anybody who wants to speak about it? That's up to you. No, no, that's up to you. I don't have your item. Anybody that, yeah. is, there anybody, is there anybody in the audience attending that would like to have an input? Please. I'm Lex Scrumhound. Um, I really wasn't planning on saying anything today, but I did listen to Joe yesterday and have thought about and read what he proposes. My hat's off to you, Joe, for presenting this and starting it. I'm glad to see the commission to finally get their heads out of the sand. This thing is huge. And New River County has a problem. It's not now, but it will be in the long run. I've spoken to you about it before. By the way, I don't appreciate how you all responded to me, but. We've got an alternative water supply problem coming ahead of us that your utilities department has pointed out with respects to the groundwater. This can be addressed at the same time. I'd like to expand on what Joe's saying. We have three major drainage districts in Indian River County. We need to incorporate all of them in this planning. How you do that? Joe's proposed one for the southern part south of 60. There is an old drainage district or a drainage option that exists in the Felsmere Farms Platted subdivision. It's south of the city of Felsmere. It's in the old Jack Berry property. It extends all the way to Lake Okeechobee as I see it in the Platted subdivision of Felsmere Farms itself. Susan, I don't know if you are aware of that, but it exists. It was put in play at the time to provide for the coastal drainage districts for an alternative way of draining. That option needs to be looked at. It's a shorter route and it interconnects the potential of two, three, two of the other drainage districts. And it fell, I'm sorry, Indian River Farms can also tap into that particular flowway if you put it into play. So you need to look at that seriously even if you have to condemn it and take it back, I think it'll be a more viable option if you're trying to push everything through the St. John's Water Control District because it's not going to do, not going to happen. You can't do the high water circumstances or big rainfall events, and that's where most of the water goes to the uh, lagoon. There is another aspect to this that needs to be thought about. And that is when you divert water from the lagoon, you are diluting the water that's going there and you're increasing the solids that go into the lagoon. That has to be factored into this, pro this problem. And how you resolve that, 
the only way I can see it is combine that with the possibility of being able to put on-site retention and having an alternative water supply for offsetting your water needs coming out of the ground. That is a viable option that can be considered in this process. The water going to the St. John's Basin, considering the size of this flowway, is also a filtration process that can be done and improve the water quality going to both places, to the lagoon on one side and to the basin on the other side. So I urge you to seriously look at this as an option to incorporate with what Joe's proposed and hopefully this county will begin to develop a way of resolving its pollutants going to the lagoon and going to the west side of the county and at the same time provide yourself with a potential for alternative water because in the year 2050 if you're expecting to get it out of the ground I can tell you that's not going to happen you can't do it if the, the water coming underground to us takes 200 years to get here and we're depleting it and it won't be there so that's my two cents uh, think about what I said and good luck thank you thank you Alex I see some uh, rather formidable uh, experts and knowledgeable individuals there does anybody else wish to step up and we're good we're good <laughs> Joe you made him happy that's all right group, that's a tough group back there boys. anybody on the internet upon motion by Commissioner Ehrman, seconded by myself. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? You got a unanimous one, too. Thank you, everyone. Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, well, I think that concludes our agenda, uh, with the exception of an announcement that tomorrow uh, will be our budget hearing, 9 a.m., right here in these chambers. Uh, we're hoping for a one-day event, as been customary for many years. Uh, if we need to, we'll, we'll be here Thursday as well. But that uh, workshop will be here, and uh, we hope to see you all here to see how we're carving out the future of the funding of this great county. One more thing. Yes. Today is Dylan's birthday. Uh. Happy birthday, Dylan. Happy birthday, Happy birthday. Dylan. <laughs> Very sneaky. We sing. I'm sorry. Really? You don't want a song? No, we're good. You don't want a song? I'll let it go by without saying happy birthday. Oh. Oh. Happy birthday, wow. Dylan. Thank you. Thank you. Happy birthday, counselor. Yes, sir. Anything else for the greater good? I saw your hand. You didn't have nothing? Okay. <laughs> At this time? We'll see you all tomorrow, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. here. Meeting adjourned.